morning. Welcome. Uh, my name is Keith Powers. I am the chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. We are here today for an oversight hearing on violence in our New York City jails, uh, which follows up with a hearing we had roughly two years ago and uh, hearings that preceded me here in the City Council as well. Uh, over the years, and over the years I've been here in the City Council, both the public and the City Council have been increasingly concerned about jail violence. The Council has passed various reporting bills and held numerous hearings on the topic, including one earlier this session and three in the last session, to increase transparency and accountability. And various parties have given significant attention to the issue, including advocates, union officials, the United States Attorney, the Board of Correction, the State Commission on Correction, and many more. But despite efforts by the administration to keep staff and people in custody safe, safe our jails have become more dangerous. In fiscal year 2019, the rate of fights between people in custody increased by 12%, and the rate of assault on staff increased by 37%. And according to the most recent mayor's management report, slashing and stabbing, stabbings increased by 10.4% in 2019. These indicators of violence have been steadily increasing since 2009, with no sign of abating, though, so, 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 though some signs of progress, which were noted in the uh, monitor's report. Despite this is happening, despite jail population decreasing over these years, and as we and, and continue to decrease even further with the new rollout of the bail reform, at the same time, according to the recent Eighth Nunez report, use of force incidents have continued to rise, reaching their highest level since the consent judgment took effect. All these findings are deeply concerning to myself and many folks here in the City Council. So today we're interested in examining why violence in jails is higher than it ever has been and what sort of changes the city can make to stop it. We know that the step, we must know that the steps that the department is taking to address the findings of the new Nunes Monitor and how it plans to mitigate violence today and looking forward to new facilities. We also must know whether the department is continuing to pursue the 14 point plan to address violence, whether the plan is having any impact and where we can do better. With that being said, I want to thank the staff here at the City Council. I want to thank the department, the Board of Correction, and all stakeholders here for being here today. I want to note we are joined here by Councilmember Holden, Councilmember Amprey Samuel, Councilmember Rivera, and I will note all three's advocacy on behalf of this topic. We've per all discussed you know, ways that the City Council can be a partner in reducing jail violence in our city jails. With that being said, we look forward to testimony from the department and all those who are here to testify today. I will ask uh, Alana to please swear them in. I, Hazel Jennings. Cynthia Brand. Brenda Cook. Do you affirm the following truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond to the committee? I do. I do. Good morning, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I'm Cynthia Brand, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction. I am joined today by Chief of Department Hazel Jennings and my Chief of Staff, Brenda Cook. I thank you all for this opportunity to discuss the department's ongoing efforts to prevent, de-escalate, and investigate violent and potentially violent incidents in our facilities. The safety, security, and well-being of every person living and working in the department's facility is my top priority. Under this administration, the city has made a critical and necessary investment in jail infrastructure, technology, and staff. In the past five years, we have installed 14,000 cameras, ensuring complete camera coverage of our facilities, redefined for our staff what it means to use force, and reissued our use of force policy with a clear use of force definition. We've developed a centralized electronic tracking system to track uses of force and slashings and stabbings, instituted a procedure whereby every use of force across the department is investigated by the investigations division and trained over 10,000 officers on a revised use of force policy, as well as providing them training in de-escalation and crisis intervention techniques. As a result, the reporting we have today is more thorough, more detailed, and more accurate than the statistics that we were able to provide you five years ago or even three years ago. We are building on these successes by evaluating the trends presented by these comprehensive statistics and making data-driven decisions that take a holistic look at the drivers of violence in order to improve overall safety. 
At the same time, the department is expanding its culture change efforts to support an agency-wide understanding that safe facilities are built upon a foundation of respect, understanding, and humanity. While there are no quick fixes, I believe we have positioned ourselves in the best manner possible to address the work ahead. This November marked four years since the effective date of the Nunes Consent Judgment. In this time, we have achieved an overall 85% compliance with the consent decree, including areas related to the promulgation of new use of force directive and corresponding disciplinary guidelines, an anonymous reporting system, and the development and deployment of new training curricula, including conflict resolution, crisis intervention, and safe crisis management. This month, the department continued to build on this work by rolling out the second phase of its transfer of learning use of force training module and continuing valuable training sessions between the chief of the department and the leadership of the facilities. Despite an overall increase in the total aggregate number of uses of force, the department has made important progress over the past year. From 2018 to 2019, the combined total use of force with serious injury and use of force minor injury decreased by 9%. Additionally, 74% of the total uses of force in 2019 were classified as use of force C, which means no injury resulted from that use. Further, in 2019, officer intervention to save someone involved in a fight from physical harm remained one of the top two drivers of the overall use of force across the department. In respect to our safety indicators, the total number of fights between people in custody decreased by 2% from 2018 to 2019, and there has been a 14% reduction in assaults on staff involving serious injury in the same period. Using force is a valid component of correctional practices, and as expressed in the monitor's report, force by staff in a correctional setting is at times necessary to maintain order and safety. The mere fact that, use of, that force was used does not mean staff acted inappropriately. As I have stated, every use of force is now documented, and in the context of this hearing, it's also important to note that the use of force is not synonymous with violence. Use of force is defined as any instance where staff use physical intervention to gain compliance and can include a range of qualifying action from placing a hand on an individual's elbow to guide someone down the hallway who was resisting, even if only passively, to using force to break up a fight. To support safer operations, we must focus not only on the total number of uses of force, but on the force that is avoidable. To that end, within one day of an incident, each use of force is closely scrutinized to evaluate if the force used was a result of something we did or didn't do that caused, contributed, or escalated the circumstances leading up to the use of force? And if, had we acted differently, could the use of force have been avoided altogether? When a review determines that a use of force is avoidable, action to address the circumstances, including retraining and potentially discipline, is taken immediately. I am proud to say that between January 2019 and December 2019, there has been a 66% reduction in avoidable uses of force across our facilities as a result of this effort. This tells us that staff are improving in their compliance with operational policies and taking steps to conduct themselves in a way that avoids creating or contributing to circumstances that require the use of force. The monitor's report makes clear, however, that we still have hard work ahead of us in order to fully achieve the goals of the consent judgment and we are not shying away from that work. Since the release of the eighth monitor's report, which covers the period of January through June of 2019, the department has been in close collaboration with the monitoring team to develop new initiatives and solutions to support safer facilities. That said, the core of making our facilities safer must come from an internal shift within this institution. Culture change is not just about changing the way the department treats people within its custody, but changing the way we treat each other and how we approach our jobs. We have made substantial strides in this effort, including increasing the transparency of our operations, 
hosting regular meetings with community members and advocates at our offices and with the Board of Correction, and participating in dozens of community-based meetings to discuss the future placement and design of our new facilities. In furtherance of our efforts to create a culture based on respect and an appreciation of our shared humanity, staff have also been directed to refer to people in custody using professional, person-forward terminology. In addition, our Training and Development Division has taken on a mission-driven effort to support leadership training at all levels because we know that if we do not develop the leaders of tomorrow, any progress we make today risks being lost in the future. In addition, we are continuing to look outward and are gathering advice and information from around the country and the world in order to truly modernize our practice. This department recently joined criminal justice experts and community leaders on a trip to Norway to learn more about their practices. While not everything we saw in Norway is immediately transferable, this trip was enlightening and has continued to shape the way we are devising solutions to some of our most challenging situations. Throughout the latter half of last year, the department was establishing the next phase of its culture change effort, a training program known as Outward Mindset which connects facility safety with human approach to jail management. In January, the entire executive team and facility uniform leadership participated in outward mindset training, and DOC Academy trainers have been certified to leave these training for our staff. This month, the two-day outward mindset training will be rolled out for all personnel working in one of our jails, including uniform staff, non-uniform staff, staff from DOC and CHS, program providers, and volunteers. Outward Mindset Training promotes the belief that in most cases, a healthy and successful organizational culture can be achieved by embracing principles of understanding, communication, and mutual respect. It instructs and uses credible messengers to prove that everyone in a jail facility is made safer by interacting with each other with an appreciation for the full scope of a person's humanity rather than viewing people as objects. Through the Outward Mindset program, staff will be supported in conducting themselves and engaging with people in custody in a way that minimizes situations that necessitate the use of force, which will in turn create an environment where force as a path towards compliance and safety is needed less frequently. This course has yielded positive results for law enforcement agencies, including the Utah State Department of Correction. We are bringing in this program because it works, it aligns with our goals, and we believe it will be successful. Meaningful, sustained culture change is a process we are fully engaged in, but it takes time. We see evidence of culture change every day, and that sustains us, encourage us to keep pushing forward. There are no easy answers or quick fixes, but we have put ourselves in the best position possible to tackle the challenges ahead. This work is critical to the success of our agency and our collective commitment to ensuring a New York City correctional system that matches the values of our great city. By approaching this work together as public servants, public officials, and community members, I know we'll, we will be successful in this important mission. I would like to take this opportunity to share a video used in the Outward Mindset training that exemplifies our new approach to safety and compliance, after which my colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have. And there, there are several gang members in the house, and we get them all secured and rounded up and we've separated the main group of the gang members off from this one individual that the detectives wanted to talk to. So he's standing by the couch, and tactical protocol says that we put everybody in a seated position. So I look at this guy and I say, sir, I need you to sit down on the couch, please. And he looks me right in the eye and he says, I'm not sitting down on that couch. But this guy was dead serious, convicted, he's not sitting down. And my initial reaction was to push him down on the couch. I could literally feel my arm moving that way. But I had just been to uh, one of my inaugural Arbinger facilitations. And one of the things we focused on was the influence pyramid. I know I recognize right away that I'm at the correction, the tip of the pyramid, because I'm telling him to do something. I'm making a direct correction, and it's not working. And one of the principles I remember the facilitator emphasizing was that if you're having problems at one level of the pyramid, 
the solution's generally at a lower level. So I thought, okay, what's the next lowest level? Teach and communicate. So I start explaining to this man why I need him to sit down. I say, sir, here's the deal. We're gonna be coming in and out of this house with all kinds of equipment to search and photograph evidence. Uh, we're gonna be moving around a lot. If you're standing up, you're gonna be in the way. Other people are gonna to wanna to stand up. It's gonna prolong our time here and it's gonna make everybody's day longer. You know, so I really need you to sit down. And I was pretty proud of that effort, by the way. And he looks right at me and says, well, that's good, but I'm not sitting down. Now I go back to that natural instinct. Move back up the pyramid, push him down on the couch, but I'm fighting it because I'm thinking I'm gonna stay in this, I'm gonna stay in this, and I'm gonna work my way down the pyramid. What's the next level? The next level down from teach and communicate is listen and learn. So I simply ask the question, sir, why won't you sit down on the couch? At that point, he looks at me and says, I'll tell you why. I was shot a few weeks ago. I've got seven pins in my knee. The doctor said if I, if I bend this leg, the pins are gonna pop out and I'm gonna have to have two more surgeries. He said, I'm not doing that for anybody. It was like this light bulb went on all of a sudden and I'm thinking, man, I wouldn't sit down on that couch either. If I was in that position, are you kidding me? Like I, I, just, I just understood in this moment why this guy was so resistant. So I look around, I find this stool and I said, I'll tell you what, if I move this stool over here and we can position your legs straight, you can sit down and have your leg on the stool, would you sit down then? And he says, yeah, I'll do that. So we get the stool in position, we help him navigate into a seated position, get his legs straightened out. Everything from there goes smoothly. And I'm sitting there reflecting on this, like in the moment, right? Number one, I'm excited because this worked. Like, you know, what I, something I learned during a training actually worked when I operationalized it, you know? You don't understand how rare that can be. I start reflecting on the potential cost. Like, what would have happened if I would have used the correction and just shoved this guy down? You know, the pins are popping out of his knees. We're gonna have to call an ambulance. Now he's getting loaded out of there on a stretcher. Everybody in the neighborhood's gonna see that. He's gonna tell his version of the story when he gets out of the hospital, and it's not gonna sound anything like my version. We're looking at the potential for lawsuits. We're looking at the potential for community complaints. These things are almost certainly gonna happen. And even if we win the lawsuit, the cost of litigating it is incredibly high. Um, man, it just struck me, that all these potential consequences, how they were avoided by this short, thoughtful conversation by working this framework that we had learned in the facilitation. And, you know, it literally took as long to work through that pyramid from the top down as it took to tell the story. And that was the amazing part. It was extremely efficient. Okay, you guys said you're done? Okay, thank you. Um, I, you know, I'll just note, I, I read the report last night from the monitor, I didn't read the 300 pages of it, but I read you know, the, the substantive parts of it, and, and then I read the testimony, and there just seems, to me, there seems to be a disconnect here, and I, and I, and I don't, I mean that, you know, with, with respect, I think it does note a number of areas where the department's made progress and is moving towards compliance, and I, I note the number around 85% compliance, um, <coughs> Uh, seems to ignore, though, that there are still significant elements here that uh, that the, re the monitor notes, and I, I just I'll just read to you some of the pieces that we picked out, um, which is that you know almost every indicator seems to be that our jails are more dangerous than they've been. In the eighth report, the Nunez monitor uh, found that from January to June 2019, use of force reached the highest level since the consent judgment went into effect, with the average rate use of force rate at 7.41, a 90%, 98% increase since 2016. And I think I was just looking at the charts and it was down from the 3% level uh, earlier in that. Even since the end of the most recent reporting period, public reports under Local Law 33 of 26 indicate that use of, force rates in, uh, use of force rates in every category, most importantly Class A use of force, which is the most serious class, have continued to go up with 10 incidents of Class A use of force in June 2019 and 43 incidents in November. Even violence between people in custody is going up as well. According to recent reports, there was a spike in violent incidents between people in custody starting August 2019. Between July and August, the number of assaults between people in custody involving serious injury went from six to 27. From August to September, that number nearly doubled and there were 51 assaults between people in custody involving serious injury. The numbers 
have then remained high with 42 incidents in October and 41 incidents in November. I'll just be honest, this doesn't seem to reflect the numbers I read. I, I, I don't discount for a second that you take the issues, you, you, the department takes these issues seriously, that you are making, trying to shift culture and make meaningful impact here, but there does seem to be something reflected in the report that is not substantively addressed in the testimony. And I, I think that that is one area that I am particularly concerned about. And so, can, can you share with us? I mean, can you share with us more? And, and, and if you want to contest these, these I'm, I'm happy to hear the, the counter narrative to it. But it does feel like we're getting presented a picture of a, a miss. We're, we're missing a piece of this, which is you know, substantively addressing the issues that are outlined in the monitor's report. So, can you share with us you, in your testimony, for instance, you mentioned. <clears throat> The department has been in close collaboration with the monitoring team to develop new issues and solutions to support safer facilities. I think you outlined some of those, but what, can you share with us what those new and what, what can we expect that in, in a, next year, if we have another hearing, what do we expect to see in terms of meaningful progress towards solving this issue? And, and what are those solutions and initiatives that you're collaborating with the monitoring team on to get safer facilities? So um, first, I have read all 300 and something pages several times over, and I take that report very seriously. In fact, um, the entire executive team has read it, as have the facility leadership. Uh, I don't think there's a disconnect. I think um, in my opening remarks, I, I wasn't misrepresenting our understanding of the report. I was trying to highlight some of the progress that we've made and where we're going in the future. Um, with regard to uh, the 85 percent, that it was a significant lift for the agency because we had to build the systems that laid the foundation to move forward in culture change and process improvement. So systems that did not exist, policies that were outdated and had to be changed, curriculum that had to be developed from scratch and then approved from the monitor, that all took time. And for that to be completed in four years' time, I think um, was, was successful and should be applauded. Our staff have worked very hard to get, to get to that point. With regard to the use of force numbers increasing over the past um, four years with regard to the consent judgment, I think we have to take a look at the reality was that we didn't have cameras everywhere in our facilities. We didn't have 14,000 cameras. We do now. There's absolutely no place in any of our facilities where an event can, take happen, can happen and not be captured on a camera. We have body cameras now in one facility and are rolling that out across the agency. And so as we redefined our use of force for staff, as we mentioned earlier that a use of force could be guiding somebody by touching them by the elbow and moving them down the corridor, prior to the consent decree, that was not classified as a use of force. It is now. And so every incident like that has to be documented, a report written, counted, and investigated by the investigations division. So we don't know accurately what our numbers were in use of force in 2012, 13, 14, because we just did not have the, the camera coverage that we do now and to that end, in December, we completed that rollout of cameras. The entire calendar year of 2019, we were fairly consistent in our uses uh, on a daily basis. And so I'll let the Chief of Staff talk about those numbers, but I just want to be clear that yes, the, the monitor does report accurately that the numbers have increased, but we cannot be sure of what our accurate numbers were when we did not have the tools necessary to report accurately at the time. Uh, oh, sorry. Sure, I just, yeah, and I just wanted to um, uh, elaborate on the point that Commissioner Bryan was making with respect to the data. And so where we've seen the increase, uh, the substantial increase in the count of recorded use of force has been in that C use of force category where there has been no injury um, to any person in custody or staff member, and that 
force is largely driven by that definition that the commissioner identified, which is uh, to compel uh, to act or not act in a, in a particular way, including you know, guiding even with passive resistance. And we see that in the um, PMMR that was uh, just released for that four month period for fiscal 19, July to October, there was actually a decrease um, in a serious injury uh, to staff as a result from assaults from people in custody. That's a violence indicator and that's improvement. Where we saw an in increase in the uh, total number of assaults on staff, again, assaults on staff are categorized with uh, serious injury, minor injury, and no injury. Uh, the number went from 401 to 440 for that PMR period. That 440, uh, the bulk of the assaults on staff are no injury, and that includes something throwing, someone throwing an object, for example, um, a t-shirt, um, a, a, a piece of paper, and if that strikes the staff, it is recorded as an assault on yeah, staff. Yeah, but, I mean, but, but with due respect, though, we don't want people, sh you know, throwing objects at staff I, either. Absolutely, it's it's not an acceptable, um, you know, behavior, and our staff should you know, be treated with respect, and people in custody should be, re you know, retreated with respect as well. But that, I'm, I'm qualifying for you that what the numbers represent, I think, really have to be understood before we go and just say that a, a greater number equals uh, a, a greater presence of, of harm or violence. I, so I understand that. I, I'm not even objecting, injecting my own personal opinion. I'm reading from a 300-page report of a federal sure. monitor that the, but the, the, monitor, the monitor and the Nunez consent judgment is focused on use of force and harm. And I think, again, we just have to be really cognizant of when we're talking about use of force, understanding what that means. And the, I'll turn it over to Chief Jennings at this point to talk about the serious injury use of force, which is that class A, and a realignment of uh, data collection that was driven by a, a Board of Correction rulemaking change with respect to serious injury mid-year in calendar 19, which is the reason we see that increase in those um, small in number, um, but serious injuries. So we're talking um, the class A use of force or the class A um, injuries to staff as a result of a assault okay. or a serious injury to a person in custody. So good morning. Uh, so back in July and August, one of the things that we did as a recommendation from the Board of Correction is that we work with the Correctional Health Service on a line in our data. And what they did for us was they defined what there were nine categories that they would define as being a serious injury. And so we worked with them to uh, revise our, our policy we also worked with them to uh, revise our uh, injury reports to our persons in custody. And so what we uh, came up with was that we went back and we trained up hundreds of persons, and they too also had to train up their staff. Uh, we now receive a daily report, which we call an end of tour report, where they are identifying injuries that uh, they have classified as serious. They are now checking off one of the nine boxes to indicate if it's a serious injury or not. If a person has to go out for some uh, x-rays or additional treatment, they will identify that is pending and then the end of tour report will actually close the injury report out. And also on a monthly basis, they are giving us all of their use of for, uh, all of their injuries that they have defined as serious injuries. Uh, we also began closing out every injury report uh, that was uh, generated during the month to make sure that it was properly investigated. And we're also making sure that where we find trends, where things are happening at, we're actually coming up with plans to abate those issues. Okay, I, I would note, so some of the things we're talking about I think are after the fact measures of reporting and cameras, which I think are good. I'm not downplaying the idea that we should have more ability to sort of understand what's happening and report. I think that we also are looking for proactive measures. Some of the, some of the recommendations that are in here related to uh, making sure that staff are appropriately equipped to be able to uh, de-escalate a situation. There's some discussions around um, uh, staffing. We'll, we'll, I'll go through all these different topics as well, um, but also just sort of management of the population and uh, not exasperating s situations. Um, I'm, re I'm just, I'm literally just reading for this and, you know, unsafe and ineffective techniques, things like so forth and so on. I will go, th we'll go through those. Can we just go to the, um, 14-point plan, the Department of Corrections 
this is under your predecessor, Commissioner, uh, mm -hmm. had announced to reducing violence. Is that still being implemented? And can you share with us what the department is doing within that 14-point plan or any changes that have been made to it? Well, let's start with the word. Is the DOC still implementing the 14-point plan? That is correct. Okay. Just okay. To, be, to be clear, the 14-point plan, um, many of, of those elements of the plan were uh, implemented and, and it's about maintaining. So it's not uh, about completion to the extent that it's about implementation and maintaining. So for the most part, many of the items in the 14 point plan were um, something we could put in place and then that was it. But there are components where it's implement and then maintain. So we're maintaining those that um, are ongoing. Okay, has anything changed from the 14 point plan? Have you, has the department made any changes to it? I, we haven't made changes to it, but we, I would say we've built upon it to the extent that, um, you know, uh, one of the points of the plan is keeping weapons out of our facilities, and we've introduced um, the use of, of ionizing body scanners in calendar 19 with uh, authority of uh, state legislation. Um, we've, you know, added to um, our comprehensive, obviously, security camera coverage from the time that the 14-point plan was um, issued to, you know, what the commissioner referred to as, as 14,000 cameras to date. We continue to um, identify and enhance our first line uh, incident response. We've, we've continued to uh, improve leadership development and culture. And again, I think that what the commissioner highlighted in her testimony and as evidenced by the video with the Arbiter Institute and our outward mindset, um, culture change, you know, that we are establishing there a framework for sustainability and support and facilitation of uh, staff's actions in custody that can find a greater uh, and more um, appropriate path to safety without the use of, of com what I would refer to as command and control techniques. That's through building relationships and, you know, understanding, you know, people in their scope of their humanity. Um, we've continued to focus on um, one of the 14 points was re redefining the investigation division. We've continued to build and are continuing um, to this day to enhance and improve um, and um, really work with the monitor in particular to retool some of those component parts of the consent judgment with respect to the investigation division that have bogged us down and proven to be in practice, um, you know, un um, cumbersome at a level that is um, counterproductive for everyone's goals. Um, obviously, the performance metrics and analysis, the department has embraced um, and added a tremendous amount of technology and data and systems that allow us to both capture um, activity and metrics and of our operations, but then to be able to conduct um, analysis and report out to oversights and um, within ourselves um, as an agency to understand what we're doing and to make decisions that are driven by, based on data. Um, we continue to improve um, our custody management process, and as our population is decreasing, the percentage of our population that are in custody on uh, violent felony charges is increasing. The percentage of our population uh, with um, mental health diagnoses or serious mental illness is increasing, and the percentage of those who have uh, been identified as um, gang affiliated are increasing. And so it's important that while our population decreases, we continue to stay focused on how we can best um, maintain um, the custody of the individuals in our care. We've also obviously extended and uh, continued to extend the uh, targeted training, which was a, a point of the 14-point plan. Prior to um, this administration, um, training had been something that had been significantly downsized um, due to both um, staffing. Um, we, the department was, had been understaffed, and uh, people were only making it out really to training that was absolutely necessary as a matter of requalification. Um, and so anything that was considered extra, which was certainly everything else, and I would put that in, you know, the uh, the weeks of training that our staff now receive on an, on an annual basis as members of the department. And then raising our facilities to a state of good repair. We're continuing to invest and we're adding air conditioning in, um, in facilities, um, um, in our uh, in our facilities as we can um, with limited capacity due to the infrastructure. We're making um, ADA um, uh, modifications. We've uh, continued to maintain and will maintain the facilities um, in good working order for the extent of uh, the duration of their life um, before we have our borough-based facilities. And so oh. that's a general overview of, of the points of the 14-point plan and, and where we are and where we continue to press forward. Okay, and we will probably have some for follow-up information on that. Um, we have, I think, data through, uh, with, uh, can you give us the, the last two months of data related to use of force incidents, December 2019 and December and, Jan and, the, and January 2020, uh, with um, use of force incidents, Class A, Class B, and Class C? Yes. 
So for, um, and I can give you the four months trend. So in October of 2019, we closed out with 688 total uses of force. That was 20 A's, 129 B's, and 539 C's. Can you see the, do the, can you do that breakdown again? Sorry, 688. 688, right. 20 A's, 129 B's, and 539 C uses of force. Okay. For November, we closed out with 648. Uh, that was 19 A's, 113 B's, and 516 C's. For December, we closed out with 636. That was 24 A's, 134 B's, and 478 uh, C's. And this month, uh, January, we closed out with 579 uses of force. Um, and I don't have the breakdown as of yet for the A, B, and C's because that data won't finalized until the fifth of the month. Okay, and can you give us a number for assault on staff for those, that same four month period? For? October, November, December, yeah, January. one second. So for assault on staff for the month of October was 102, uh, November 86, December 90, and January we closed out somewhere a little under 80. So it was about 78. And do you have numbers for serious injuries? Sure. Uh, October serious injuries numbers were 88, November 80, December 90, and for January, uh, 101. So we're going the wrong direction in terms of staffs on, in I mean, injuries on staff. For, so for I think, I think, so I, I think the difference is for the serious injury was that prior to uh, this new policy, there were things that H&H uh, &H did not state were actually serious injuries. We have a definition for serious injuries and then there are things that they added on where they clearly define and they gave us nine categories. Um, so this is why we're seeing an uptick with serious injuries because they are telling us specifically what classifies as a serious injury. So we're, we're attributing, I'm gonna ask a couple more questions and I wanna make sure my colleagues can, can get questions in because I know they're interested in this category now this area knows. But are we saying the staff injuries Serious injuries are going up because of reporting? So serious injuries that we are, that I just gave you the numbers for, only speaks to persons in custody. It has nothing to do with staff, separate and apart. No, no, sorry, I was asking for, uh, the numbers I was asking for were assault on staff and serious injuries on staff. So no, those are numbers, the numbers that I just gave. Those are serious injuries serious to? Serious injuries for okay. people in custody, right. nothing okay. to do with staff. Okay, can you give us the, the I gave you assaults on staff. Okay, you gave us assaults on staff and then the second category, I was asking for serious injuries to staff. As the, I was asking for assaults on staff, serious injuries. So no, I will have to provide you with that data to tell you specifically out of the assault on staff, what has been categorized as a serious injury. You don't have that with you today? I don't have that number with me. I Does anybody have, here in the department have that number? We don't have the class A assault on staff breakdown for that four month period that you're asking for, no. Okay, we will ask for a follow up. And, yes. and, and now your numbers make more sense to me because yes. one number of, okay, it made more no. sense to me as I read them. Okay, um, I'm gonna take a break. And I wanna come back to some of the recommendations from the report, um, but I will ask if, 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 um, if colleagues have questions to give them an opportunity to, to ask. Uh, I think we're starting with um, Council Member Holden and then Council Member Bear. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I just have a few questions on, uh, I wanna follow up with the assaults on staff. Um, there was a 37% increase according to our charts of assaults on staff in 2019, is that correct? You're That's looking correct. at the PMMR um, for the four month period, is that what you're referring to? No, I have the whole year. Or the calendar year? Yeah, uh, 2000, uh, 2019, uh, COBA says 35%. I think the numbers that we have a 37% increase in assaults on staff. I think he's looking at that. So according to, according to the department's data, the total number of assaults on staff uh, increased 13.4% um, calendar year 19 to calendar year 18. 13? 13 for total assaults. I think I have assaults on staff with serious injury increasing 
32% from calendar 19 to calendar 18. But that number, and I can give you the count, the count is 66 in 19, and it was, eight, it was 50 in 18. All right, but just t total assaults, and I'm not saying what's serious. Yep. Total assaults in calendar 19 were 1,109, and in calendar 18, it was 978. Okay, why, we have different stats on, on ours. So, what, you know, like I, I'd like to get to the bottom. I mean, they're both bad. Do, do we have, uh, if, let's say assuming um, that our stats are correct, um, we have 15, I guess we have assaults on staff per 1,000 average daily population uh, is 1,512, um, which is a 37% increase, that's what we have. Um, and the correction uh, officers union say 35%. Um, wh why is, and you say, you're saying it's, it's, it's lower. Why though, why with a, uh, less population, why are assaults on staff increasing, not decreasing? So I, I think that's a, that is, thank you, that's a complicated question because obviously we're, it's involving a dynamic of, you know, not just, um, uh, you know, our staff and what they bring to the, the, to the oppor opportunity of these assaults, but also the, people committing the assaults, people in custody. And so I think, you know, what we look at is that while the um, behavior I described earlier in response to Chair Powers, that where we see that increase of um, volume in the assaults on staff are in the assaults on staff that actually uh, result in no injury. And while that is unacceptable um, behavior to throw an object, even a soft object like a piece of clothing, uh, and strike a staff member, um, that, is, um, that is recorded as an assault on staff um, in, in these numbers. The focus where we uh, look at is in the in the volume of um, assaults on staff um, of injuries as well. And so where we see that uh, in decrease from calendar 18 to calendar 19, um, we saw a 20.6% decrease in the minor injuries um, to, assault, uh, to staff after an assault. And then we see that increase between calendar 18 and um, 19 in, these, in the serious injuries from 50 to 66. But um, uh, the prior year in, in 17, it was 63. And so we are focused, obviously, on the harm and the risk of harm. Um, and that's where you know, we're, we're working both with the outward mindset, the culture change, um, adding additional um, tools as we reduce our um, population and our facility footprint to um, deploy our staff um, as additional support um, in, in various positions, including housing positions, um, where possible. We're rolling out um, uh, for proof of uh, concept a unit management structure um, at our young adult facility at RNDC um, that began in, in this year in calendar 20. And uh, again, we're looking at ways where we can identify the use of our uh, resources um, in a way that's most effective at uh, reducing the risk of harm and the actual um, harm to those both in custody and our staff. Okay. Um so let's assault. Uh, so let's just. I know it's complicated. You just you just explained it, and it is complicated. However, uh, they're increasing, and the assaults on staff, like you said, is unacceptable. How many rearrests were made based on the assault, assaults on staff? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that's if somebody assaults um, a staff member or other um, detainee, there's a rearrest, especially if they're more serious. I don't have I don't have the breakdown of how many of the rearrests were due to an assault on staff versus a rearrest due to an assault on a person in custody, um, but we can we can get that okay, breakdown um, for you. In splashing, which um, can can mean a lot of different things, but um, incidents have increased, I guess, and with that, um, is there any punishment for spl uh, splashing, throwing urine at a, at, a, at a staff member or correction officer? Is there any? Is there a punitive? Um so there, we have what we do when we have persons who are splashings. Uh, we have splash guards that have been fabricated that staff could put in front of the cell if the person is actively uh, splashing. We also, the staff member has the right to elect to uh, surrender their uniform um, for testing in which the person can be rearrested. We also have the uh, formal process, which is the infraction. Uh, the, the, the person who's splashing, we put them at the end of the tier. We make sure that they are subjected to searches on each tour. So those are the, the, some of the formal things that we have, and we're coming up with informal resolutions as to 
different things in which uh, we can uh, take away for, you know, as a disincentive to, for their behavior? Um, still, it, it's, it's not clear that we have any measures to uh, discipline uh, for somebody, you, you're saying we put up a shield for the correction officer. Uh, the intent uh, to attack somebody, wh whether it's uh, throwing urine, feces, mm -hmm. whatever, at spitting, uh, there should be some uh, actions of discipline that's taken um, on the uh, detainee. There has to be, I mean, now we did away with punitive seg. Um, we've also have a waiting list, I think, for the people that are on uh, punitive, or at least are scheduled to do uh, punitive segregation, right? There, is there a waiting list um, this year? No. So, so first, I'd where like to it say hasn't been, people are just waiting for discipline. So we did not do away with punitive segregation. Um, we did away with punitive for eighteen twenty-one year olds. You did for eighteen to twenty-one and, and seriously and mentally ill. Right. Correct. Yes. Right. So there, every incident of splashing is investigated, and there is um, a method for infracting someone who is, who is alleged to have splashed somebody. Everyone in custody who's charged with an infraction has the right to due process, and there will be a determination made at the end of that hearing, and then a penalty imposed. So we don't ignore splashings. We respond to each and every one. And as the chief said, the officer can surrender their uniform so it's tested for the substance as to what was actually splashed. And to protect the officer, splash guards are put up and um, cells are searched so that we can take away implements that are used to splash the officers as they come by. So when we did away with punitive seg for 18 to 21 year olds, did we, did we have numbers for incidents, um, violence against staff or incidents against staff for the 18 to 21 year olds? Has that gone up? Because if it has, then obviously the measures aren't working because if punitive seg is taken away as a punishment for, for any uh, incident against uh, staff, has the, Assault's gone up. We don't. I don't have the. I don't have the breakdown for uh, the 18 to 21 year old uh, incidents, but I can tell you that our uh, our violent uh, incidents, whether or not it be towards people in custody um, or towards staff, uh, our um, population under the age of, of 26, 27, or so, is our um, population driving um, those violent acts. And so the 18 to 21 year olds are obviously still in that category of, um, of that population, which we know to be our um, most problematic with respect to acts of violence while in our care. Yeah, I asked a simple question, I get that. Um, I asked for 18 to 21, because that's something that we could measure. So if punitive seg for eight, we take it away automatically for any incident, um, yet the counties surrounding New York City um, all use it, punitive seg, and I'd like to know what their numbers we are. Will, we, will, we will get you for the 66 assault But see, this is something you should know right away to measure. We, we, did, we did something that no other city had done, 18 to 20, take away punitive seg automatically. No matter how violent that person is, we're taking that away. Yet we don't know, we can't measure if it's working. Anybody here, all, everyone here should know that automatically. We will get you the number of the 66 serious okay. assaults on All staff right. injuries that were attributed to right. 18 to 21. Okay. Thank right. you. We can come back. Uh, Councilmember Rivera. We'll be followed by Councilmember Amper Samuel, and we have uh, been joined by Councilmember Rory Lansman as well. <clears throat> so, thank you so much for being here and for your testimony. I guess I, I want to ask, uh, you mentioned culture change. There's a current culture of violence within the Department of Correction, and that's why we're here today. And you mentioned, I'm going to ask you a couple questions about training and some of the initiatives that have failed and what you're doing. But what efforts are you undertaking to praise the staff who has actually had positive performances? So when we have incidents, um, we engage staff and we uh, provide staff uh, recognitions. They get uh, employee of the month. They also, when we look at video and video selection, so we have what's called the transfer of learning where we uh, 
choose videos that give good or bad incidents so that when we recognize that we have these incidents, it's not just about someone looking at a bad incident, it's about also praising the person who did their job effectively and professionally. So um, I think it's important to note that staff wake up every day and they come in ready to the, do their job. And we've actually began to build a lot around staff wellness and for um, you know things to, that they could use to de-stress themselves, rather it's exercise rooms, rather having um, faith uh, ministries that walk around in the facility to actually still talk to and engage staff. And anytime there is an incident, we have the care unit that actually go out to meet with the staff to make sure that they're okay. And it's comprised of not only uniform staff, but we have a psychologist and we have counselors so that they are actually engaging with them and you know, they're seeing about their well being because they too, you know, are actually coming into work and no one comes in to say, I'm going to uh, hurt someone today. They're coming in to do their best. I would all just, uh, just like to add to that, that um, our public information office has a very robust internal comms plan. We highlight staff who do a good job in our bold print magazine, on our DOC TV, uh, on social media platforms, and our fraternal organizations oftentimes um, recognize those staff who have done well with awards at their events. Thank you. And in your testimony, you mentioned that you trained over 10,000 officers on the revised use of force policy, as well as providing them training in de-escalation and crisis intervention techniques. Over how long has this did this training occur to train these 10,000 officers? So the new use of force policy was um, revised and promulgated as part of the Nunez consent judgment that was uh, went into effect in the uh, November of 2015. And so the um, policy um, between November of 2015 and uh, 2000 and the end of 2017 was the period where we conducted that training for existing members of service. Since 2017, anyone who is newly hired um, between 2017, end of 17, um, and um, calendar 19, those folks um, received that uh, use of force training as part of their um, uh, academy, six months of academy training. Our staff then um, are receiving uh, annual refresher training um, in the use of force policy. So that's all staff, and so that's, uh, that's ongoing, as well as um, what the chief um, uh, was mentioning with respect to using videos. And so part of our, um, in calendar 19, um, we were doing the uh, transfer of learning, which was identifying um, both positive, um, you know, well-executed mm -hmm. um, uh, policy compliant force, and then also force that was um, uh, outside of guidelines or, or, or concerning or reflected uh, something that we wanted to uh, readjust um, and realign staff on in compliance with the policy. And so those transfer of learning and the use of, of uh, the use of force videos um, with our mentoring captains who are academy staff at the facility level um, occurs daily. How is the retention at the Department of Corrections? Has there been a high turnover in the past few years? So our average rate of attrition is approximately 100 people per month, and it's been steady over the past few years. So every new person that comes into work at the Department of Corrections receives the training. Are you upgrading, adapting, including new information in your training to reflect this culture change that you continue to mention? Absolutely. Um, historically, correction officers are trained in custody and control, and um, we are changing that to include now the outward mindset, a different way of uh, interacting with people in our custody, using evidence-based practices and core correctional um, practices in the training so that we don't have to go back and retrain people when they come through the door they'll get the training that provides the mindset that we want them to have right from the start and I believe that's a practice going on across the country as correction agencies change uh, with the changing times and I ask because you recognize that some initiatives haven't been affected effective, and that the report actually mentions an inability to manage those in custody. So what are you doing differently? 
What are the most pressing issues that the, the report has identified that you feel is something that you are going to take on? Two or three problems outlined in report that the DOC sees as the most pressing, considering that it is reported that there is an inability to manage some of those in custody, and you recognize that some initiatives haven't been effective. So what are you doing differently? Thank, thank you for that question. So absolutely, I think, you know, and that's getting at the crux of, of where we have pivoted in uh, the latter half of 2019 based on the establishment of, you know, revised policies, training, and, you know, and, and, a, and a, as the commissioner mentioned in her testimony, a uh, reduction of, of our use of force that was identified as avoidable by 66% over the course of, of calendar 19. We, we have gotten really good at um, some of the operations um, with respect to that force policy and our staff's understanding of it, but where we are um, not seeing the success is in making a difference in um, the circumstances and that give rise to the need to be using force to begin with, and that is where we are now taking that uh, through with uh, the outward mindset training to culture uh, to building relationships because clearly the command and control um, is not yielding the results that we all desire and so by building relationships by you know um, teaching um, and learning by um, asking questions like the video demonstrated a simple question about why to understand others motivations to really see people as people our staff to look at each other as people, to look at people in custody as people, and to understand our shared objectives and how we can get there um, through a, a more humane application of um, our policies and procedures and, and, and yield better results. And so a piece of that um, uh, that is demonstrated in operations is what I mentioned earlier with respect to unit management. And so one of the things that we agree with with respect to the, in, you know, the monitor's report um, with our our frontline supervision and uh, the ability of a supervisor um, to be um, a guiding um, force in a um, positive way to support de-escalation and the resolution of conflict so that it doesn't require the application of even appropriate and necessary force um, to gain compliance. And so that's that's where we're focusing. Unit management is a, um, is a we've engaged in the process of studying up um, all staff at our young adult facility at RNDC. And so all of the staff there are steady. We are taking um, six housing units in one building and um, pr doing a proof of concept with respect to how we can use a ca housing area captain as the unit manager to, again, provide additional support and on-the-ground instruction to our staff, um, our officers, in order to understand, you know, that understanding people in custody, understanding their needs, understanding their frustrations, and resolving those can be the way and the path forward towards both compliance with, you know, directions, rules, policy, and, um, and better outcomes. That's where and, we're headed. And I understand all, all the things that you are trying to do, and I think there's a lot of advocates in this room who, who really, we all want you to be successful. But what are you doing to hold abusive officers accountable, and how many have you fired in the past year? So before we talk about the specific numbers um, in the disciplinary process, I do want to say, first off, that staff is our greatest asset, and the city spends a lot of money and time in both recruitment and training of our staff. And the um, outcome isn't necessarily to terminate somebody if they've done something wrong. Who in this room has not made a mistake at work in a new job and not gotten fired for it? So the intent of um, an investigation or discipline is to change the behavior and redirect someone. All of our staff um, under civil service rules are afforded due process. And so when there's an event, there's an investigation a determination and a recommendation. And the range of discipline can be anywhere from a verbal reprimand to a written reprimand, retraining, days off, a demotion, a combination of things, and then finally termination. And the agency does not determine termination if, if, an, if an officer or an employee um, chooses to elect to go the entire route and go to oath. And then an administrative judge would determine whether or not that person would be terminated. If they decide to terminate, that's the end of that matter. Or if they decide not to ter recommend termination, then there's what we have um, called the action of the commissioner, where I can overrule that and can choose to terminate someone, which I have done. We also have um, the EISS, which is the early warning system. So when an officer um, starts to get a high number of uses of force, 
attributed to them. And it's not necessarily whether it's unnecessary or excessive use of force, but they may be in a post. For example, the intake, where the opportunity is greater for them to get involved in a use of force. We place them in the early warning system where they have mentorship um, and oversight to make sure that they don't get in trouble in that area. So, and now I'll let the Chief of Staff talk about the numbers. So in, um, I'll focus first on uh, calendar 19. Um, so in calendar 19, related to only to, uh, I'm focusing on use of force terminations, um, uh, a total of 20 people um, were terminated. Either five were, of those 20 were actual terminations, 10 of them were retirements in lieu of uh, termination, and five were resignations in lieu of termination. So 20 people related to use of force in 2019. In addition to that, and so those were tenured staff, there was an additional 20 um, who were uh, what we refer to as a personnel determination review. So when you're on probation, um, we can um, terminate you, but it's referred to as a PDR. And so there was an additional 20 who were in a probationary status. And so total of 40, 40 individuals for use of force only um, uh, terminations from the department. In addition, um, in 2019, there was a 212 um, negotiated plea agreements um, related to use of force, and those uh, included a range of uh, uh, punishment, usually the sus suspension and a number of uh, days, so uh, days lost, monetary um, days. And so the uh, suspensions last for 15, um, 20, uh, up to uh, 45 uh, days, including then the actions of the commissioner um, for those who went to oath, and she terminated. Okay, <clears throat> I think I, I think I understood all that, but I'm going to go over the acronyms and sure. I just have two more questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being so gracious. So the three officers and the one captain who watched Nicholas Feliciano as he attempted to commit suicide the night before Thanksgiving, are they still employed with the Department of Correction? So I'll, I'll let the commissioner um, answer that question. So. Um, Currently, there is an active investigation going on, so I cannot speak to the specifics of that. Those, the officers that were alleged to be involved in that served a suspension, and they are still currently employed with the agency, and we are awaiting the outcome of the investigation. We will follow the recommendations. They're currently on modified duties, which means uh, they have no inmate contact. Modified duty, okay. My last question is, since this is a hearing on jail violence, unfortunately. I want to ask about when violence incurs and people get hurt. So the BOC found significant disparity between the number of serious injuries reported by CHS and the number of serious injury incidents reported by DOC, with DOC reporting 80% fewer serious injuries than CHS. Can you explain that disparity? So um, as I had previously stated um, in reference to the serious injury reporting, uh, we have collaborated uh, with CHS and it has been about them I positively identifying what criteria fall under a serious injury. And now with the new use of force, uh, the, no, the now with the new injury report policy, uh, they clearly indicate which they have nine categories in which they check off, or if the person, if they have to go out for further uh, exams or x-rays, then it's a pending report, and then it, the injury report actually gets closed out with an uh, end of tour, which there is an automatic fee which uh, notifies us what injuries have now been classified as serious injuries, and that's done the reconciliation happens on a daily basis, and it also happens on a monthly basis to ensure that the numbers are more aligned. And I just want to, I know you have to coordinate medical responses, and we want to make sure that we're tracking uh, those responses. And BOC recommended that DOC and CHS jointly publish data on the number, type, cause, and location of injuries to people in custody. Will you commit to doing that? That's data that we provide to the Board of Correction on a monthly basis now. And, you, and with, with, I'm saying that DOC and CHS, that you jointly publish data, so that way there can be consistency and transparency. It's just my ask of you for that commitment. Well, since we're both reporting data and now we're aligned in the collection of data, um, 
we will make the, we, I can't speak for CHS, but certainly I'm, I'm willing to uh, co-author a report for the Board of Correction if, if they are as well. Are, are, is CHS here? No. Violence causes injuries, injuries is health care. Okay. So I just want to say thank you for answering all of my questions and I want to thank the chair again. And I'm glad that, that you mentioned the Department of Corrections really seeing people as people. And I hope that we can come to, I guess, some sort of conclusion on solitary confinement and finally ending it. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask one follow-up question and then I want to hand over to Councilmember Amprey Samuel for questions and I appreciate Councilmember Rivera's questions. Just to clarify this, I know you've said it a few times, I just want to clarify this. Right now, when we talk about, let's say, talk about serious injuries, DOC is reporting this and CHS is reporting this. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And now, as of last year, you are coordinating or, or, or matching in terms of your Correct. number? Correct. I'll give you an example. Yes. And so we always, um, the department, it classified um, based on injuries, our incidents at an incident level. And then CHS, due to, as the medical provider, was capturing uh, incidents and uh, injuries um, for people um, in their care. Our definitions are now aligned, and we are getting anything that we qualify in our incident data as serious. We've been told that the injury meets a serious definition by CHS. Okay, so are there reporting moments when you report that your numbers would be different? Um, not, we report incidents, CHS, um, you know, reports uh, patients, so individuals. And so uh, we, we, our incident is classified by the highest level of injury sustained by anyone involved in an incident. So, so this is where I'm at my elevation. Why isn't CHS the one reporting the serious injuries? They're the medical professionals who are examining the, the person when they come in to, the, to see them. Why, why would they not be, like, why, I, with, with due respect, why would DOC be the reporting serious injuries if, why, why wouldn't CHS be the reporting entity for that? I, th I think we both um, uh, report, and I think, again, we have a, 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 a slice of reporting that focuses on, on incident um, operations and incidents, um, in addition to capturing the underlying uh, injuries as to each particular person involved. CHS reports on injuries um, that they treat um, for patients in their care. Okay. I'm going to uh, now ask, uh, hand it over to Councilmember Amprey Samuel. Thanks. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I had one question when I came in, and now I have like 10, but um, I'll ask two. <laughs> Commissioner, you stated that staff is your greatest asset. So with that, have you included the union at all um, or offices directly um, in your feedback and input and suggestions for decreasing the number of violence? And if so, can you explain how sure. you have been able to incorporate that? Um, I, I have meetings regularly with the union president. We have discussed um, all of the issues within our jails and how to make things better. We frequently have town hall meetings with um, staff where People from each facility gather um, in an area where they're free to ask questions, make suggestions, and talk about what's bothering them. Uh, we do that with executive leadership, and then the facility leadership does that on a routine basis. So how do, you, how do you take that feedback and that information and include it in um, policy changes and the work that you're doing? And the reason why um, I, I feel some kind of way about the testimony is when you first started just watching the video of um, an officer who um, is from someplace else and um, how everything that he said was like a, a light bulb and you know this is this is great and this is what we're doing and I'm just trying to figure out because um, sometimes it's like no-brainers um, but how do you include the work you know, the people that are on the ground that know that's been working there for 20 years and, and you know, have, they've been doing this forever. So one of the things that uh, we began to do differently is that anytime there is a change to policy, 
I have uh, working groups and I involve all different levels of staff to bring them in collectively to go over the policy to talk about how it will affect them operationally to get their input as to what they think will or will not work so I can make sure that their voice, their voice is actually heard. And that's something we started doing differently so that this way when the input is done in the beginning, the outcome becomes so much better and they automatically buy in because they now feel like I have a voice. Uh, we've also done surveys where people can anonymously talk about how they feel uh, with the changes, we've done that on more than one of occasion that we have the PMO to do. So this way, they have a reporting mechanism that they could say what they feel in case they don't feel like they could say it to one of us. But I think there's a lot of transparency that has happened so that staff understand that they can say what exactly it is that they feel and that they do matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just... So I'm done with that question, um, but I just want to state that um, it's different when you allow someone to be able to express themselves and how they feel about something that they have to do or something that has to change um, compared to if someone says, this is what I go through and this is what I suggest we should do different. It's like two different things. And so I have not heard how you are actually incorporating um, the, the feedback. And if you are, can you give me an example of something that was overwhelming coming from the officers or the union? Um, uh, so so heads? We have, we've added mentor captains to the facilities and so that they are engaging with the staff because 75% of our staff have under five years on the job. And so what may be uh, significant for them I may feel somewhere different because I came up through the ranks and I once was a correction officer. So my experience may be very well different from their experience. And so those are the things that we try to get at the root causes of how is your job hard? What, what's making it hard? What are some of the things that we could do to assist you? Because let's face it, it is that one or two or multiple correction officers who are on the ground that matters the most because when they fail, the failure falls all, goes all the way up the chain to myself. So it's important for them to understand their job, to be able to have the tools that they need to do their job and that they feel safe. I think what the, what the chief said is very important in that if that was part of feedback that we received from the 3,000 new officers that we hired that they didn't know their job, they were on posts with other people who had also graduated with them, there were no senior staff to guide them. And so we implemented the mentor captains who aren't there to discipline anybody or catch anybody at doing something wrong, they were actually there to support them in learning their jobs. Part of the, the um, Safety and Compliance Center was also a support system so that we have officers watching in live time, real time, housing areas where they can call and say to a brand new officer, you have a gate that's not closed. Um, if you go close that gate, you're gonna avoid a lot of problems today. And so there's support um, from many people on the ground and that was part of their feedback is, we don't know what we're doing and we need some help. Okay, thank you. Um, and my next question, which is my last question, um, is related to the report. When you look at page 11 of the report, it states the department has not been able to keep pace with timely investigation of staff misconduct, and there is a backlog of approximately 6,815 investigations. The backlog delays um, the imposition of appropriate discipline for staff misconduct, and it goes on to talk about effectively managing staff and to reduce the misuse of force if you're able to, to um, clear the investigations. So um, in addition to that, pending investigations of staff misconduct and 2,001 pending cases were lost to the 18-month statute of limitations. So 
At the last Board of Corrections meeting, you testified that DOC is instating an, an intake squad to clear up the backlog of investigations. Can you just give us a little bit more background on what the progress is in stating the intake squad and how DOC came up to the conclusion that this was the best solution? And just can you just give us a, a the overall as to what's happening. Sure, thank you. Um, so yes, so the intake squad is, um, is up and running, um, and uh, the intake squad is staffed by 40 investigators, um, plus um, uh, attorneys from the Trials and Litigations Division and then support um, uh, paralegals. And so the purpose of that intake squad is to address what has been um, identified as um, the backlog of volume that has been created by the operations for the investigation division as outlined in the consent judgment. So all use of force investigations under the consent judgment need to be investigated um, by the investigations division. And that's referred to as a preliminary review. And then in addition to that, investigations division would take a category of cases, a volume of those cases for what was referred to as a full ID investigation. The remainder or balance of those force incidents would be returned to the facility for a facility level investigation. So we're really talking about two investigations for each use of force incident. One by ID and then the second either by ID or the facility depending on the category. And what we saw and what the monitor identified as well through four years of operations of the consent judgment protocols was that that was um, unduly necessary in its um, uh, burden and its volume. And so those preliminary reviews um, are in fact in most cases not preliminary. They are, they should, they can and should be full-fledged investigations that should be terminated um, at a conclusion uh, to pursue discipline or not at that point. Um, but but by operation of the rules of the consent judgment, they do not. And then in addition, we saw that the volume of cases being returned to the facility and for investigation, um, that that facility investigation process was yielding um, disparate, um, potentially disparate outcomes. And then you're talking about incidents that are being managed at a facility level across, you know, uh, what was it, one time 12 facilities and now, um, and now 10. And so what we have done is then through the uh, intake squad centralized all use of force investigations will be con still conducted by the investigations division that that intake squad will then conduct those investigations in a uh, timely manner and within 30 days uh, the bulk of those investigations will be completed because those investigations will be done um, you know, thoroughly and completely and then resolved with a pursuit of then uh, discipline or, um, or closed with, with no actions. Um, the remaining investigations that aren't you know, able to be completed in 30 days because they require you know, a more extensive evidence collection, uh, the uh, testimony of witnesses under oath that has to be scheduled, um, et cetera, those, uh, that smaller number of investigations will be um, at some point during those uh, in, uh, first 30 days returned to an investigations division investigator who's not on the intake squad to commence and um, complete that investigation in a longer time period. So what this has done is, um, is really identified a way to um, really harness the value of what the consent judgment identified in terms of the, uh, the quality and the content of an investigation, but to eliminate some of that, uh, what has been really um, clearly identified as a level of duplicity and then administrative uh, burden, which has not yielded the outcome and the ability for us to build upon, as you uh, referenced, um, the un, you know, identification of unnecessary and excessive force and to really take that timely and, and um, apply that and learn from it. The investigations um, intake squad, um, in order to commence that here um, in uh, 2020, they had to clear their, uh, those investigators, those 40 investigators had to clear their backlog first. So they've started clean. And so we, um, through the end of calendar 19, in the last few months of calendar 19, investigations division worked closely with the Nunez monitor and uh, his deputy monitor and associate deputy monitor to identify a way for those intake investigators to bucketize and then resolve their investigations um, uh, to, to in fact clear that backlog. And that process uh, yielded um, uh, accurate and um, agreed upon and really productive results. And so that same process uh, that cleared about 2,000 cases for those intake investigators is now the process that the remaining investigators in ID are using with the monitor's oversight to clear any remaining cases on their backlog. And so we expect that all of those use of force backlog cases um, from up and in through calendar 19, which is uh, referred to um, in the monitor's report, um, will be resolved in these coming months. Um, and I would note that you know the ID unit on a 
a much um, a smaller scale had identified and um, you know aligned with a, a similar process of uh, case review, investigation, and closure that was effective as it related to our uh, PREA, our um, Prison Rape Elimination Act investigations, and um, and streamlined and identified a process to become very successful at the timeliness um, of those cases and investigation and any uh, resolving any backlog that previously existed in years past. And so we um, absolutely believe with work um, uh, that has been done with the monitor and with um, their oversight and concurrence that these are the um, paths to success to maintain the quality of investigations, um, but a more timely investigation, removing duplicity, taking uh, investigations away from um, returning to the facility level because that was, um, uh, you know, again, the, for the reasons I identified, it's, it's all going to be centrally located out of ID. We can move swiftly to charges and uh, discipline through trials by partnership in that intake squad where appropriate. Thank you. Okay, I, I have a number of questions, and then I think there's a follow up question uh, from Councilor Holden. I just want to go through some of these first. Uh, I want to go through some of the recommendations from the Nunes Monitor. Um, the first being the, uh, they made a whole host of recommendations, one being that the DOC scale back its over reliance on probe teams who they stay, had they state can uh, at times escalate rather than de escalate a situation. Does the department agree with that assessment? Yeah, so I think what, yes, we do, um, because I think if we are, are all under in the under, same understanding of a probe team, a probe team is, in, is a, a B-level incident response in the department's incident command system. Um, and so an A-level response um, still uh, has assistance provided to staff arrive on the scene of, 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 of an incident or alarm or, or some precursor um, disturbance, but that A response is, a, is referred to as a de-escalation team. The B response team, which is a probe team, um, comes in um, with, you know, uh, they're uh, suited up in their gear. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group of officers plus a supervising captain. And so when you arrive on scene with that extra equipment and, and tools, the presence of um, that probe team certainly signifies something and communicates something and we acknowledge and we uh, uh, recognize that. We want to see more incidents and um, precursor disturbances resolved at the A level. And so we agree with the monitor. We made revisions to our, um, our command level policy with respect to um, that B level response, the probe teams, because what we identify in the monitor um, shares um, in the identification is that supervisory assistance and you know things that the commissioner and the chief were referring to before. And so what, what we made clear in revisions to the policy with respect to the response of probe teams is really about um, not so much the probe team, but actually the supervisor who should be responding to the area first while the probe team is responding to the staging area to get um, their equipment and their, their, their probe team supervisor. So who is that area supervisor, that captain, who should be responding to that area first and helping that officer who's you know, sounded an alarm because they have some type of fear uh, or concern um, that they need support. And so who, you know, that captain should be responding to that area and so we provided some additional level of detail and instruction as to what the expectations of that captain are. And I'll let the chief talk about that in just a moment, but the other item that we added uh, clarification and expansion in the policy to address uh, the monitor's stated concern was to the tour commander, which is the ADW, the assistant deputy warden. And so the assistant deputy warden tour commander is, is operating, is overseeing the operations of a jail on any particular tour. And so again, adding some clarity for expectations for those two supervisory roles so that not that an officer still wouldn't request that and call for that assistance, including a B alarm, a, a probe team response, but that we would be interceding with supervisory support to identify whether or not, in fact, having that probe team march into that you know, area was, in fact, necessary and required. Um, and so I'll let the chief talk about those supervisory expectations. So um, what we had did was that we went into the incident command um, level which gave uh, levels A through D that Brenda had previously spoke about. And we worked with the monitor just of ladder to uh, actually revise our policy to talk about the expectation of the captain, uh, the control room captain looking at live monitoring feed to be able to provide the tour commander with tools to make the best decision. So for us, uh, when a probe team responds, it ties up the entire facility. 
it actually uh, stops all services. So we have staff who are predetermined and they are divided up into sectors of the facility so that when it's isolated, the rest of the facility could actually flow and have normalcy. So those are some of the things that we had done to correct that behavior. Okay, and, um, and, and those are those new policies, that directive or policies are in place today? That's correct. When do they start? Uh, the policy was revi revised was last revised. year, but it's a, uh, I think it was uh, maybe October or November? In October, yeah. I believe. Uh, do you have any numbers on the, re the use of probe teams since those, since those changes in terms of use before, use after? We can get you the alarm responses, the A's and the, the B's for the latter half of uh, last year to mm -hmm. date. Okay. Another recommendation was about the problem with having staff who are not consistently assigned to the same post within facilities. It creates, it essentially creates no continuity in the relationships with both people in custody and supervisors. And to quote the monitor, has prevented development of constructive relationships between staff and supervisors. And these transitions compromise continuity in messaging and supervision. Um, do, does the department agree with that assessment? Yes. And can you tell us how you are addressing that recommendation? So um, we are addressing that with the unit management protocol and we are starting in RNDC uh, where we have already steadied staff, not only on their tours but on their posts and with their captains as well and breaking down the larger facility into smaller housing units. That develops the relationship between the officers and the people in our custody and we will roll that out across uh, the agency. That's not the only place that we've steadied staff, um, not only on their tour, but their post, and so we're doing it um, as we go along. I do want to remind everyone that our officers do have the, the right by contract to be on what we call the wheel, and that allows them to be scheduled on any tour at any post, and that is contractual, and so we can't eliminate that for them. But we agree that steady staff and steady tours and steady posts are the way to go. And when do you expect that that is going to be? Uh, uh, should, should I, can I? Did you guys just do a new contract? We're in the process. You're in the process, and this isn't something you're considering discussing as part of the contract. Since I mean, the answer was essentially I, the contract. I think we're we were not going to discuss particulars of the negotiations, but certainly to the extent that the commissioner has identified, um, you know, we agree and the department agrees, um, you know, with uh, the steadying up of posts. And as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, focused uh, first on our, uh, as a facility-wide basis, our RNDC, our young adult facility, and um, steadied up the, the greatest number of posts there possible. Um, and then throughout the department at other facilities, there are an, a significant percentage of staff have uh, a steady tour, if not also a steady awarded post. Okay, and when's the timeline that you expect that will happen in other facilities? It, it, it's underway. It's underway. Okay, so uh, it, just as a follow-up question, if when, for instance, bor borough-based facilities open, is the expectation that those would have steady staffing, or more, or more steady staffing? That's our expectation uh, for now and in, 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 in moving forward, even before the borough-based facilities. And what is why was RNDC chosen as the first one to do that? Because RNDC, um, well, RNDC has um, uh, a young adult population predominantly, which uh, the 18-year-olds are of a specific focus uh, for the consent judgment. Um, and we were identifying um, that uh, proof of concept for unit management um, at uh, a building of six housing units at RNDC. And so we were adding that there and studying up staff for purposes of unit management. Um, it goes hand in hand, so that makes sense. We're also um, uh, rolling out the Arbinger Institute's Outward Mindset Culture Change at RNDC facility-wide as our first facility um, currently. So that it's a package of, of training and operations that we are, um, uh, that are working in synergy with each other uh, at, at that one facility uh, focused and then we're moving forward through other facilities and department staff. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the monitor also found an overwhelming lack of consensus about what constitutes a use of force or misuse of force across line staff, fat facility level leadership, uh, and, and more, and, uh, and, and discrepancies around whether and when force is necessary, unnecessary, avoidable, unavoidable, or excessive proportional. Does the department agree with that assessment? Um, that's not an easy yes or no answer, uh, because we have, we have put things in place that have changed that, and that report uh, ended in June of 2019, and so 
Um, while we may have had that, we have improved in that. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we have been focusing on not solely the number of uses of force, but what, what is an avoidable characteristic. And so we started off the year very high. We ended at a 6% rate, and there was a 66% decrease in the avoidable use of force. And so I believe that what we've put in place with the um, retraining and with the transfer of learning at roll calls, that has enhanced our ability to agree um, across the agency on what is an appropriate use of force. Okay. Um, can you give us an example of when an incident that was debriefed, um, and, or can you give us an example of some of that new training and how it is, how it is any sort of changes you've seen in terms of particular incidents? So what happens with the transfer of learning is that the mentor captains, um, they go out at roll call and uh, biweekly there are video selections where we are giving deliberate scripts so that when they address the staff, everyone is saying the same thing. Um, and they are out and they are indulging the staff um, at roll calls. And then once a week, there is a meeting that's held with, the, with our Nunes Compliance Unit in which we implement it with the management staff, deputy wardens and above, and so an ID. And so what happens is that we go over uh, a slew of incidents, we talk about their trends, uh, either upward or downward with uses of force, we go over video, we talk about uh, how this happened, if it could have been avoided, and then it's about a concept of now everyone is more aligned. Because when we first started, the facilities felt one way and the investigations division felt another way. And now we have aligned where everyone is seeing it from the same lens with I'd our management staff. Just like to add, in the, in the transfer of learning at the roll call, everyone uh, about to go on tour sees video. And the mentor captain asks questions, and they respond by using an electronic clicker. And so you can see in real time how many people in that roll call understand whether this was good, unnecessary, avoidable, the different characteristics, the different questions. And then as there's a discussion about that particular incident, there's a retesting at the end. And so you can see in real time whether or not they understood the concepts discussed there. And then you can take that information and you can use it um, using a comparative data and over time to see how we're improving. And when did you implement that, that learning you're talking about with the clickers? 2019? Last 2019. year. Last year. March, March of last year. Okay. I want to shift just, oh, sorry. I want to shift to a, a few more categories. And um, the first is the use of body scanners in the jails, something that I believe the department got authority for in 2018, I believe in Albany. And can you tell us about, um, f for starters, where are you in terms of implementing the body scanners in the uh, city jails? So currently we have body scanners uh, in four facilities. We have two in OBCC, two in AMKC, one in RNDC, and one in GRVC, which is fully installed and operational. And we have currently one in NIC, in EMTC, and VCBC that are currently offline and we're just waiting for the updates so that we can operationalize those uh, body scanners. Okay. and. Um can you tell us about how many weapons have been recovered in, sorry, they, they started, was July, was it July of last year? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and can you tell us how many weapons have been recovered since you've implemented body scanners? Yes, so currently the contraband recovery is 91 items. So it's 66 uh, weapons and 25 contraband other. And how many of those were recovered after someone was placed in separation status housing? I have that. So we have, do you have that number there? Because I have how many people refused? 28. And then our contraband numbers are broken down. Uh, how many was recovered? Do you have the yeah. beginning? Okay. So. 19 items, 17 weapons, and two non-weapons were recovered um, 
and surrender after surrendering prior to being scanned. Can you restate that? 19 weapons? 19. Uh, 17 weapons and two non weapons. So 19 total items. Were recovered so after? Prior. Prior to. Prior. So the person is standing before the machine and says, I'll give you what I have. Oh, okay. I got you. Got you. And, okay. and the rest would be after the person was placed into. Some. No, the uh, 59 total items were surrendered after a positive scan. 38 of those items were weapons, and 21 were non-weapons. So those 59 total items came after using the scanner, aware of a positive scan, and again, so those folks did not go to separation because they surrendered the items. Are there repercussions for an individual who surrenders an item before they go through the scanner? Um, in terms of repercussions, um, you know, obviously, the extent that an item is um, an element of uh, contraband, there can be an infraction, and there um, should be, um, you know, an, a department's uh, disciplinary process um, pursued for that. But um, that's that's the repercussion. It's a part, so, if an individual before going into the scanner says, "I have an item, and I will give it to you," they could face consequences for that. They could. I mean, but obviously, um, you know, the department is. It, there's discretion, and to the extent that our intent here is to recover dangerous items and remove them from circulation and use in our facilities, um, you know, there is, I would say, certainly latitude um, for the uh, chief of department and the bureau's chief of security and um, their staff to reach compromises um, in order to obtain the items, create safety, and and um, remove the weapons. Okay, and am I right saying is Manhattan the only facility that does not have scanners today? I. Co correct, uh, and, and Rosie's, uh, the female facility. And Rosie's, and when is the Manhattan facility expected to get? Um, at this point, um, I don't believe that um, we're going to install a machine in Manhattan, in part because of the borough-based facilities and the um, logistical uh, challenges of getting a scanner. It's too big to fit into the Manhattan facility. So for Manhattan, we, um, we transport individuals. Um, we still have the machine in, um, in the Brooklyn space, um, and we can use uh, that facility or other. Do you facilities. transfer the individual there to get scanned, and then they Correct. get rehoused in Brooklyn? No, no, no we're Brooklyn not housing is in currently Brooklyn. closed. Yeah, right. So how, so how are you possibly using You're just bringing them there to scan them? Correct. Or, another, bring them back or to another facility, yes. Yes. OK. Um, and then there was, a, there, was a, there was a question about training with individuals about using the body scanner. So I, just, I wanted, um, if I could just finish the, the sure. data. Sure, sorry, sorry, yeah. yes, sure. So the number of contraband items that were recovered uh, after placement and separation status, there was 23 items, 14 of those were weapons, and nine of them were um, non-weapon contraband. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, the, to, the question I was asking, the, um, there was a, the, the BOC's audit in November of last year found that 30% of body scans were conducted by staff who had not completed all the requiring, required training uh, in both radiation safety and body scanner operations, and 44 placements and separation status initiated by those who had not been trained at all. Can you tell us, uh, give us an update on training for using the, the scanners? Sure, so um, that uh, information that we received from the Board of Correction, as the Chief identified, um, you know, was, uh, was concerning. And so the department uh, w went and conducted an, uh, an indep our own audit of the information received. We referred um, for action for full investigations and discipline. Um, those um, incidents that we also concurred identified that um, staff who had either not received um, training were operating the machine or using um, the machine, had received training possibly, but using the machine, um, using some uh, another operator's login. Um, and so after our, our video, preliminary video review and review of evidence, um, documentary evidence, we forwarded that to investigations. Since then, we have implemented an audit um, protocol where we are auditing um, the use of the scanning machines um, and have provided and posted uh, lists of, of staff who are authorized and trained to use the, machiners, uh, the machines at each facility. Um, we also identified additional staff um, that could, in fact, be trained based on their uh, post assignments that are in that area so that we have as many staff uh, in the intake areas of facilities tr uh, trained as, as possible. We also have um, staff within the um, uh, other divisions of the Bureau Chief of Security um, who have been identified um, and have been trained on the uh, image, image and an analysis and review in addition as well. And because those layers of oversight, um, in order to review the images and the scans and make determinations about who um, 
should be placed in uh, to separation housing who is believed to be having uh, in their per secured in their person a weapon or an item of contraband. There's layers of review and process and procedure to that, and so we identified additional people up that chain that can also be trained, and they have been. So that's the current status, and we'll continue to um, uh, review, like I said, and audit and identify additional staff that get assigned to posts, newly assigned to posts in those areas to be trained um, prior to assuming the post as well. And I want to I do think individuals should be all be trained here, and I think I think as I understand it, some folks are. You know the logistics of it at times, where the individual has to go through a body scan, or they may not have a person who's trained there. There is this uh, sort of, uh, you know, you 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 have to get the person. You want to get the person scanned. You may not have an available person there who can go through the training. I think it's important we go. I think it's important that people we recover those weapons and the contraband, but also that we have individuals who are trained to be able to do it. And I understand that sometimes there's a logistical issue with having an individual nearby who. You're shaking your hand. So, so no. So what, what we've done is that we've made sure that we have um, allotted uh, additional training sessions to persons and that each tour commander has a list of available staff in their facility who are trained to operate the uh, body scanner. Okay. Um, just one last question here. The, the body scanners was a bill in Albany that, as I understand it, the city had uh, had back and forth with Albany in terms of trying to, or actually had the scanners and then had to get authority for, to use them from from Albany. Are, are there, are, you know, we can, we can do, I think there is certainly a need for training. I think there's certainly a need for uh, uh, appropriate use and making sure that we're, we're, you know, we're maintaining appropriate use of the scanners. On the other hand, if you look at some of the numbers, they're recovering weapons and I think it's one tool in the of, of many that can be uh, helpful to the department in terms of in ensuring that we are recovering weapons and as long as they're being appropriately used can be used to be a uh, important measure for safety and and reducing serious injuries in the jails are there other measures whether it's legislation in Albany or legislative measures down here in the city council, budgetary or others that the department is, let, let's talk about Albany or in the city that the department's asking for, doesn't have the authority, doesn't have the resources for when we talk about uh, any of the issues, whether it's around reducing use of force, training, whether it's reducing staff assaults, any of the things we're talking about today. Are there other measures that, and I add that because the council did add its voice to that discussion in Albany, are there other issues or measures or resources that you feel the city council can be helpful to or support of in terms of ensuring safety in our facilities i think that oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. i think that you know the city council um you know did its 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 biggest um and um obviously most um, dramatic uh, show of support in uh, granting the ulerp application um, for new facilities which are our borough based new borough based facilities will be a tremendous step forward in um, in in safety and modernization and for those in both who uh, live and work in those facilities um, aside from um, that which we, we obviously are very grateful and thank the council and um, the council member for your support um, uh, I can't think of anything um, particular that comes to mind presently that is a you know a legislative item or a um, something that um, along the lines of you know body scanners or, or training um, we certainly have and the department has been provided um, and we acknowledge um, the tremendous support and resources um, from uh, this administration and um, you know it is it is uh, work that we are putting in every day um, and I think what you saw um, and heard from us today reflective of the um, culture change um, uh, outward mindset and that um, what we saw in our uh, trip to Norway and what we've taken from that low, those uh, dynamic security and how we how we get there from here um, it's it's not about a, a body scanner tool it's about um, as I you know refer back to my conversation with uh, councilwoman uh, Rivera it's 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 about seeing people as people and how can we find and identify and support our staff in a path forward um, that creates safety um, through something other than uh, you know, a physical implement or a tool um, uh, of a, a physical variety or uh, a command and control and how can we actually gain greater compliance through understanding each other um, um, in that way. I would also add that, um, you know, we are, um, I know we're here, we're here today and, and a lot of the talk has been with respect to the monitor's report, which the data that the monitor's report covered ended June 30th of last year and there was obviously the department has you know been working uh, every day um, uh, throughout the calendar year of 19 and, and through calendar year 20 to date um, and we take these matters seriously every day and we just closed out I know that uh, Chief Jennings mentioned 
that we, um, when she was rattling off all of her data to you earlier with respect to the use of force over the four month period at the end of 2019 and then uh, January 2020's numbers, that when we look at our force um, numbers and our violence, other violence indicator numbers um, from 2020 <laughs> um, uh, compared to uh, calendar year uh, January of 2019, that we are seeing improvement that is heartening and that tells us that um, what we're doing is making a difference and making a difference in the right direction. And so uh, we had, uh, approximately 100 fewer uses of force in January of 2020 than we did in um, January of 2019. And that far exceeds any uh, rate reduction of, uh, you know, in consideration of our reduced population. We saw fewer um, assaults on staff, including assaults on staff um, with serious injury in uh, January of 2020 than uh, January of 2019. And so um, while I know that um, we all would want to see progress that is um, uh, greater and uh, with greater speed, um, you know, this is a progress, this is a process that takes time and rest assured we are working every day um, very hard and our staff are working very hard and we are going to get this right. And can I, just, can I, so what, can I just in terms of we're going to have a budgetary hearing and not in short order, I assume you're talking to the mayor's office about budgetary needs and uh, we certainly, this is a, I would say the highest priority issue for everybody here, including city council. Um, we certainly would like to see, in the, and I've seen the mayor's office here as well, uh, resources here to help reduce this problem as part of the city budget. And um, notably, I think in the last two budgets, we've been asking questions about a training facility for folks that work in the department. We've, I think last year, um, asked about some technolo technological upgrades to move us off from paper to using technology. Um, I would restate our uh, strong interest in seeing those items. I'll speak as my chair. My, my interest in seeing those items be reflected, and not just reflected in monetary value, but reflected uh, in an actual commitment to do that. And I, I say that because I, I, with, in addition to the ULERP, I think you know, it would be fair criticism of all of us to say we did a ULERP and we failed to address the issue of the, the training facility, for instance. And so I, I'm saying this to, as, as we approach budgetary time that I think our budgets reflect our, our values here in addition to our needs. And I think that we should be looking uh, to addressing many of those needs in this budget in a very real way. I just wanna add, I think there's a follow-up question from the two colleagues and then we will uh, be moving on. But I'll give a question to Councilman Holden and then Councilman Rivera. Thanks for round two, Chair. Um, just to follow up on the academy or the training facility, which is in my district in Middle Village, and I, you know, I visited there when I first came into the council, it's not good, to put it mildly. It's not good. So where are we with the academy, the training facility? So I'll let the commissioner answer with respect to um, what we're presently doing in terms of training space, but the administration is, uh, we're still working closely with the administration to identify um, um, an appropriate site to move forward with, but there is um, certainly pressure um, from our Nunez monitor um, and an interest, um, I know um, Council Member Holden, we appreciate um, your, your interest and support and identification of potential sites for us uh, to consider as well. And so it's, um, it's a process that is, that is underway, but we don't have a site that I can. Um, yeah, we heard that two yet. years ago. And that's the problem here, because we just keep kicking the can down the road here. So we, we're, we're either going to get a good facility um, and, and respect the correction officers and give them the proper training and the proper facility, or we're going to just keep saying we're looking for a location. Uh, we have to make it a priority, and the administration has to do that. And I, you know, I, I appreciate your efforts, but we, I mean, I, it's not up to me to find a site. I could say rebuild, you know, uh, Rikers and put it over there. Uh, or rebuild, put it on Rikers where you have space now, or take an existing building and renovate it. That should be a plan, but you know, that's, that's another issue. But we should give the correction officers proper facilities and proper training. Police uh, have a great facility in College Point. I don't know why the correction officers don't deserve the same. Um, the, I just want to talk about, you know, in speaking to, rec to uh, correction officers, they tell me that the same individuals are committing the same acts of violence against not only other inmates or detainees, but correction officers. So they go into punitive seg, they get out, they do it again, they go back to punitive seg. It's a revolving door. Um, what could be done with those individuals that are 
doing the same thing. It's really a small percentage that are committing mu much of the crime, according to the correction officers. So it is, um, and I don't, I don't disagree um, with that characterization from from our uh, corrections uh, unions. The, um, you know, when the department um, it historically and, and most even most currently, when we look at data and we look at who is driving um, incidents, whether or not it be incidents of violence, you know, uh, fights between each other, uh, assaults between each other, assaults on our staff, or even involvement um, in necessitating, uh, you know, the use of force. When we look at those um, numbers, the drivers of uh, about one, a quarter to a third of the incidents month over month um, is about, about 50 individuals. And so we're talking about um, some folks who have persistent, um, uh, we have persistent challenges managing, um, you know, both their um, behavior and their compliance and their, and, and quite frankly, their violence. And so um, the department is, um, working to identify um, with the use of data um, and greater uh, technological advancements that we have established over the past couple of months um, to really drill into the specifics of data to see times of day, days of week, um, you know, staff who have been, you know, working uh, well or working um, maybe and, and we've seen a spike of incidents. And so how can we really, uh, through an analytical presentation of uh, level of detail of our captured data. We've brought that together into a platform or uh, referred to as a, a facility risk dashboard and you can um, drill down into the levels of specificity with respect to both um, staff and, and people in custody. And so the facilities um, are working on data-driven solutions to identify how can we um, uh, partner um, with each other and Department of Corrections with the Correctional Health um, Services to really develop individualized plans to approach the management most successfully because clearly with those individuals and that cycle of um, uh, volume of activity, you know, what, what we've been presently doing is, is not working consistently if it's working at all. And so I think, you know, the chief um, could, um, without discussing the particulars of, of identities, I think can talk about, um, you know, uh, an example of that from uh, NIC chief, I think if you want to talk about that one. I'm sorry. So what we have uh, put together it, on a weekly basis is to discuss these challenging uh, persons and how best to uh, engage them and uh, to provide them with mentoring officers also so that they have relationships with to kind of help control the behavior and then working with uh, CHS to come up with behavior pro uh, uh, programs for each one of the persons because sometimes it's done on a small scale. You know, we most of them we know, everyone knows uh, by their name. And, you know, it sometimes it takes for other people to go out to have these conversations to talk about what could be done, you know, if it's a matter of reducing commissary because the reality of it is is that no one can live in punitive segregation. So just having alternative housing, smaller settings, uh, more staff, uh, staffing, better staffing levels to those persons so they're not in the average general population. Right, but uh, just let me, let me just, could, could I just jump in there for a second? Because sure. much of it could be, I mean, I heard uh, stats from, uh, let's, let's talk about Rikers. 40% of the people that are housed there or incarcerated there have mental illness. Right. And if the same person is, keeps doing violence in the, in the jails, why don't we have a mental health facility there, or do we? Do, why, why can't we have a separate facility where these people are moved into, into uh, and, and get the help they need, rather than just keeping, you know, this, this uh, punitive seg, they get, you know, they get written up, they, they have to go to trial, and then they get charged with another crime, and then we go back, and it's, you know, and then even when they get out, they commit another crime, and they're back. So I think we need, um, and that would be for the commissioner, has, has that come up, a mental health facility, uh, uh, just separate and apart? Uh, not on Rikers, but I believe as we're moving towards the borough-based jails, we have plans in place for therapeutic housing for those individuals. But uh, No, but was it talked about in Rikers? Because this is going on for years. There was a 1,500-bed mental health facility um, that was planned prior to 2014, and those plans were shelved. Just shelved, just, uh, and, and so now we're seeing the ramifications of that and increased violence, and when people get out, they just come right back. So that should have been done in 2014. I don't know why it wasn't done, but that was a good idea because we're seeing mental health issues uh, in, you know, everywhere in the population, but certainly in Rikers. It seems to be if, if the pe same people are doing the same thing, 
over and over again that it's a mental health issue. So we have, um, uh, AMKC is um, uh, our largest uh, facility with um, those that have um, um, either uh, mental health, mental observation, or serious mental illness needs and are housed there um, in large part. And so uh, the department is um, working with CHS to um, double um, the number of uh, what's referred to as PACE, um, programs for accelerated clinical effectiveness, which are in fact units designed um, for those with um, mental illness. And so the department um, is doubling those, uh, the capacity um, um, and will be completed with that doubling this year in calendar 20. And so um, we are expanding um, those um, specialized uh, mental health units. We have uh, mental observation units. We have um, added um, some uh, additional program units for um, mental health um, programs services that CHS has requested over the last year and in order to, again, to concentrate the housing of um, those indiv individuals who are their patients who um, can uh, receive um, the best um, care in that setting. And so we are um, working every day um, with um, CHS to identify, um, you know, the best housing for them. And, and many, many, many of them are at AMKC. We have um, a lot of specialized um, clinical health um, treatment opportunities at that facility. And so that's why um, the majority of them are, in fact, housed there. Okay, thank I would you. just like to give you one example of what the chief was talking about at NIC. So there's a gentleman there who is one of the drivers of, of use of force and incidents. And um, after the team got together and spoke about his needs and his issues, it was determined that this gentleman likes attention. And so he'll engage in activities to garner attention from the staff. So we gave him positive attention. We gave him a job, which he, he wasn't engaged in before. So now he has positive attention. He has a mentor officer. He's out and engaged in the facility and doing something positive. And so not everyone with a mental health issue needs the care of a PACE um, unit or, or a mental health facility. They just need their individual needs addressed, and it might be as simple as No, it's, it's complicated, I know, but I appreciate that part of it. But that's what we, we need uh, actually mentors or somebody to talk to the person sometimes to get, you know, into, the, into their psyche. But uh, yes, it is complicated, but that's why we need personalized attention. But you, you just mentioned a case which is encouraging, but we need more of that. Um, rather than just like get over there, discipline stuff, we need, really need a mentor, especially for the younger population. I guess that's happening. And, and um, I just want to, one other thing. We, um, have, we have to move on. We have to, get, we have to keep going. We have a council member. All right, okay, question. okay. So he wants, all right. Uh, I'm, I got the hook. Thank you. All right, that's all right. Thanks, Bob. I just have a question on, on um, the, the culture change, the trainings, the plan. Is there any special attention given to some of the violence that is experienced by our transgender, gender nonconforming, non binary individuals? So we have, um, that's a broad question, but we are, so, and that's not an easy answer with regard to um, how we are um, reacting to that. It's multi-layered. So when folks come into our custody, um, they, are, they are assessed for risk, for victimization, or for aggression, uh, and they are housed according to gender identity um, and preference. And so the staff have been trained in um, issues that affect transgender population. There is constant contact with our um, director of LGBTI issues in the facilities. So she um, makes personal visits to folks in, in our custody to address any concerns and issues. Um, our PREA team is also involved. There's PREA ambassadors and PREA compliance managers in every facility who also make those rounds on a daily and week, weekly busy, uh, basis to make sure that, that folks are um, housed accordingly and issues are addressed. We also have um, uh, trauma-informed care um, training um, that is um, rolling out throughout the department, including, as I know, um, Deputy Commissioner Townsend has testified um, before the um, Board of Correction previously, uh, FETI training. And 
I, I won't tell you what the acronym stands for because I, I'm not sure, but it's FETI, and that is, in fact, um, uh, trauma interviewing and um, training to, um, as their investigators are um, working on both um, uh, PREA and non-PREA related investigations and incidents and addressing, um, you know, how to approach and how to um, interview and uh, gather information from those that have um, experienced trauma in the past or in, and including if uh, tra trauma um, during our care. And so I think raising our level of um, opportunity and um, awareness and sensitivity to how to approach um, circumstances with uh, folks who come to us with a variety of, of backgrounds and experiences, but um, to be as, um, to give our staff the greatest amount of tools possible through both training and facilitation and support um, in carrying out those duties and responsibilities is, um, is, is one of our primary focuses. And, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. I just want to ask, you said trauma-informed care is rolling out. What, is, what does that mean exactly? What's the timeline? So, thank you so much. Yeah, so we've, um, we've been um, um, in partnership um, with the um, Office to End Gender and uh, uh, Domestic-Based uh, Violence. I've um, re had trainers trained um, in that, in that trauma-informed care training, and those trainers are now, um, we are identifying um, staff, and the staff are going through uh, training um, in the Department of Corrections. So that's an initiative that began in, um, in 2019 and then is, is continuing to date. Can I just ask one follow-up question? Uh, use of force in the CAPS and PACE units, can you tell us how many use of force incidents there were last calendar year in CAPS and PACE? I don't have that, that level of, I don't believe we have that level of specificity as to the housing unit type, but we can uh, certainly uh, get that back. Do you know how many use of force in, in uh, uh, a use of force A there were? I, I don't I don't know of the 66 use of force um, uh, or I mean that, that's the assault on staff number I don't know of the 141 I believe it was in calendar 19 I don't know how many were in either caps or pace but I can tell you um, without um, uh, that the both caps and pace see um, uh, far reduced um, levels of incidents including those serious incidents um, than other um, units in our department I, they, I'm asking because I think the answer might be zero yeah, I think and it's very, so it, it, I mean, that it, does at least suggest there's something yes. in the units we're talking about with, with talking about serious mental illness that may be working, including the increased presence of uh, staff and, and layers of staff in there. And I think, uh, you know, without having a conversation uh, about that particular set of units relative to others, or it does suggest th there's something yeah, that works. I think there. what we see um, that's transferable, and I think uh, what you're getting at, and yeah, I just don't want to misspeak in terms of the, the data, but it is, those are very, very low uh, levels of incidents um, with those in those in, in those units. But I think what we see is a, a close collaboration in those units in a unit management type approach where, it, but the unit management is conducted by both correctional health, CHS staff and clinicians and um, Department of Corrections st uh, staff. And so I think as we um, identify that is certainly transferable regardless of, you know, mental health or other service uh, type need, um, that, that unit management approach and everyone working together in concert um, to meet the needs and to um, minimize, um, you know, uh, so the negative outcomes in those uh, circumstances that can lead to that is is our best approach, um, uh, and that is why we are rolling that out um, presently at RNDC, and then we'll be through uh, proof of concept to the rest of the department. Okay, thank you for, for your testimony. Thank, thank you for answering the questions. The one thing I would notice somewhere in this report, and I was looking for it, you know, mentions the department's need to navigate various regulatory hurdles that exist between city and state, and I think and even potentially federal entities here, and I, I, don't, I don't assume that excludes the city council here. Um, so we are always you know, happy to coordinate with other agencies and regulatory bodies to figure out how to be most helpful to solving some of the problems we're talking about. I couldn't mention the other recommendations and not raise that one that was in there, um, and certainly we'll seek opportunities to do that. But, um, but uh, you know, but, but, but. The, the oversight and the ability for us to do, I think, is also important and helpful, but where we can be uh, uh, helpful to uh, helping solve some problems, you, you certainly have our support to do that. Thank um, you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we are going to uh, move on, and we will have, I'm sure, so send over some follow-up after the hearing as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will now be uh, calling up uh, from the Board of Corrections, Margaret Egan and Emily Turner. Thank you for everybody's patience here.
Thank you. Before you start, we have to swear you in. Put your mic on. Oh, raise your right hands and state your names, please. Margaret Egan. Emily Turner. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer honestly to committee questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, morning, afternoon. Afternoon, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I'm Margaret Egan, the Executive Director of the New York City Board of Correction, the independent oversight agency for the city's correctional facilities. Um, I am joined by Emily Turner, the Deputy Executive Director. As you know, our role is to regulate, monitor, and inspect the city jails in support of safer, fairer, smaller, and more humane jails. The board monitors conditions of confinement and compliance with our minimum standards, documents systemic issues of a problematic nature, and informs policy decisions and policy improvement with respect to the city's jails. Since its creation in the 1950s, the board has focused on data-driven over, data oversight to provide planning assistance to the Department of Correction. While the board does not have the power or mandate to manage the operations and services within the jails, it does serve an important role in providing ongoing transparency and accountability. I recently joined the Board of Correction as the executive director, and in my view, the board has an incredibly important role to play in moving the jail system forward, particularly as we plan to move into a borough-based jail system. New buildings alone will not solve the challenges currently faced by the department. With a focus on data and research as well, as well as qualitative assessment, the board's development, oversight, and monitoring of thoughtful progressive standards can assist the department and the city as it seeks to build a criminal justice system that reflects the city's values and brings dignity and respect to people held within, working in, or connected to the system. We are here to discuss unacceptable levels of violence in the jails. There is no one response that will reduce the reduce levels of violence in the facilities, and the board is committed to working with the department and all of our partners to identify a broad strategic approach to creating a safe and humane environment for staff and people in custody. Today I will focus on just three of those areas, restrictive housing, serious injury reporting, and the detection of contraband. As you know, the board has been working with the council, department, correctional health services, COBA, city hall, advocacy and advocacy organizations to develop comprehensive restrictive housing rules. The department has made great progress in developing alternatives to punitive segregation, particularly eliminating punitive segregation for adult, adolescents and young adults, excluding people with serious mental illness and, with, and those with serious physical disabilities and lim limiting certain PSEG sentences. We believe that a comprehensive set of disciplinary and non-disciplinary, sorry, comprehensive set of rules for disciplinary and non-disciplinary housing options can improve safety for all in the jails. The proposed draft rules on restrictive housing are based on four core principles. One, ensuring that people are held in the least restrictive setting for the least amount of time necessary to ensure their own safety, the safety of staff, the safety of others held in custody, and the public. Two, ensuring that those placed in restrictive housing units or restrictive statuses are done so in accordance with due process and procedural justice principles, including explaining disciplinary rules and sanctions when people are first admitted to custody, imposing proportionate sanctions, and applying rules fairly and consistently. Three, promote the rehabilitation of people in custody and reintegrate them into the community by incentivizing good behavior, allowing people placed in restrictive housing as much out of cell and programming time as practical, consistent with safety and security and providing necessary programs and resources. And finally, for developing performance measures and regularly reporting outcomes to monitor and track compliance with these rules and core principles. The board has held two public hearings, solicited feedback from the advocacy community, COBA, the department, CHS, and the general public. Um, and as of Friday, the, the period of public comment has ended and the board will seek to finalize the rules. Um, Turning now to um, the board's reporting work as an important component of its oversight, this work can also aid the department in, and CHS in identifying and working to solve these problems. One example is the board's work on summarizing data on serious injuries to people in custody 
and auditing those serious injury reports. In January of 2019, the board released the first public accounting of serious injuries over time. The report found that the department reported 81% fewer serious injuries than were diagnosed by CHS. Following this report, in July of 2019, the board unanimously approved rules on prevention, reporting, and investigation of injuries. These rules require the department and CHS to issue joint monthly public reports on serious injuries. Both agencies have committed significant resources to developing re these reporting protocols. We are now closely working with the department and CHS to fine tune the protocols and will report um, and the reports themselves and hope to make these, publics, these reports public shortly. We believe these reports will be an important tool for the board, department, CHS, the council, and the public to un understand the types, circumstances, and rates of serious injuries occurring in, in the jails and take informed, meaningful steps to address. Finally, I wanna discuss the board's reporting around the implementation of body scanners and separation status, which as we've talked about is another, highly, uh, another form of highly restrictive housing. Body scanners are a new tool that uses low-dose ionizing radiation to detect contraband. When someone has a positive scan or refuses to be scanned, the department includes, concludes that the person possesses contraband and places them in separation status. We believe the detection of contraband is incredibly important to the safety and management of the jail, jails and the board fully supports the use of the body scanners. The board released a report in January evaluating the implementation of the scanners and the department's initial use of, of the scanners and separation status. Our findings showed a chaotic rollout of the scanners which included unnecessarily restrictive conditions and separation status. In all, the report made 22 recommendations to the department and CHS on, the, on improvements to the body scanner um, and separation status practice and policy. One critical issue raised in our analysis was the operation of the body scanners by those who had not received the appropriate training. This creates a risk of radiation exposure to staff and people in custody and the potential for misinterpretation in scans, false negatives, undermine the department's ability to use scanners effectively as a tool to identify contraband while false positives lead to unnecessary placement and separation status. To its credit, the department has responded to this training issue and begun to address other findings in the report, in the report including referring verified in instances of improper scanner operation to the investigation division for investigation and discipline, issuing security memoranda, memorandum re reiterating the training requirements, ongoing revisions to their training curriculum and monthly audits to assess the impact of these efforts moving forward. We look forward to continuing to work with the department to ensure the efficacy of the body scanners and appropriate use and operation of the separation status unit. Again, these are just a few areas of our focus in, a dis in addressing the disturbing and complicated issue of violence in the jails. We look forward to continue working closely with the department and CHS on these issues and others to meet the, the goal that we all seek, to meaningfully reduce, the violent, reduce violence in the city's jails. Thank you for the opportunity to address you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Congratulations on your uh, new position here. Thank you. Um, can you tell us just generally in response, have the board's view on the responsiveness of the department to the recommendations that have been made in the recent report and prior reports? Uh, so, I, um, on the specifically on the body scanner and separation status report, as I mentioned, um, the when we ra when the board staff raised the issues that we were discovering in um, in our reporting, again both quantitative and qualitative um, analysis, the board or sorry, the department responded quickly, um, and we're continuing to work with them on on their response. Um, on the serious injury report, um, and, and I will also let Emily jump in because and, and she what was about the, here. the monitor reports? Uh, so the monitoring report, um, the the board invited the asked the department to comment on the the monitoring report in November, um, and I think the the board felt like the the response from the department was. Um, was was again a disconnect between what was stated in the in the report and and what was stated by the department 
Um, and, and the board asked the department to come back in January. Uh, the commissioner did and, and, um, and said many of the same things that she said here um, and then gave a more um, full response to the report um, by the general counsel. Um, so, so I would say in general, the department has been responsive. We continue to, to work with them um, as, we, as we raise issues. Okay. And the, with regard to secure housing and scanners, can you give us some uh, uh, sort of additional insights into what the board is looking at with regard to that? I'll let Emily go into those details. The separation status unit that's mm -hmm. been put in place. So um, the board uh, receives notification anytime someone is processed for placement in the unit. We track all of the information from the department, including um, all of the paperwork that's used to process that placement. We also have um, staff that visit the unit on nearly a daily basis to monitor conditions in that unit. And then um, as the board staff have identified issues, we've been in direct communication with the department and they've been able to respond and um, address situations that we've come across. Uh, have you, has the board found it to be in effective since they've been implemented? the use of separation status. And scanners. That is something that we um, believe the department needs to um, track carefully and um, investigate and develop an assessment plan to um, determine um, the efficacy of these scanners and their use of separation status. Um, so we found that um, in our report, we analyzed all placements that occurred through from July through November, and we found um, that of those 45 placements, contraband was recovered in five of those placements. So the board definitely has more questions about why uh, individuals are being placed and yet contraband is not being recovered. Um, and so there'll be more questions that the board has to um, has on, on that um, in when the variance um, the department has requested is addressed at uh, next week's board meeting. Okay, and the report talks a lot about use of force uh, and, and uh, focuses on, on use of force. When we talk about staff assaults, does the board have recommendations in terms of how to reduce injuries or assaults on staff? I think um, a lot of the recommendations that we've made over the years um, are you know, still hold true today in terms of the steady staffing and we're encouraged to hear um, the level of um, commitment the department has made to that steady staffing, because we do see um, that that plays an important role in developing relationships between officers and people in custody um, goes a long way to creating a culture that's um, an environment that's safer for everyone. Uh, the, what I would add is it, the department's comments on culture change are really important and culture change will take a long time and is only achieved through sort of sustained um, thoughtful recruiting, training and performance management. And I, th I think this is where the board, the board's work with the department and CHS is particularly important. We, you know, through our oversight mechanisms, we can look at data and, and raise issues that the department needs to follow up on. I mean, I think data is an incre incredibly important piece to sort of day-to-day -day management and, and that culture change. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna, uh, I think Councilmember Holden wanted to ask some questions. Yeah, I just, thank you. Um, I just wanna go back to the body scanners because I'm not quite understanding. So um, people were put in charge of these scanners without training, the proper training? So, um, so we conducted, so as I mentioned before, we receive all of the documentation for he people who end up placed in the separation status unit as a result of either a positive scan or a refusal to scan. We audited um, that, doc that documentation and we found that um, a significant portion of the staff involved in operating the body scanners had not received the appropriate radiation safety training or image evaluation training. Um, and we immediately shared our audit findings, the specifics of those findings um, with the department and they have taken um, immediate steps to make sure that staff understand they're not allowed 
to operate that scanning machine without being trained. What, what's the requirement for training? Uh, it, wasn't that just standard operating uh, procedure on that, those kind of machines? Or, and, and who? Yes, so who that is, was a viol So What was the recommended training? I just want to get to the, the specifics on this. Um, all staff, um, but per DOC policy, all staff operating the scanners were required, required to re receive operator training, which um, includes some level of image evaluation so that they would be able to understand those scans. And um, we found that um, a significant portion of people who had ended up being placed um, or um, who had been conducting scans um, in the logbooks that we audited um, had not gone through that training. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for how that could have happened. Um, we did uh, find one instance where someone had used somebody else's pin to log into the machine. Um, so that there's much um, tighter oversight of who's using those machines now um, in response to that training. And the department has implemented their own um, auditing protocols so that they're doing a similar audit to what we did when we discovered this issue. Now, the exposure to, uh, exposure to radiation, was that because they had to go through multiple times to, to the machine, or were there, are there settings on the machine? So this, um, there is a certain level of um, radiation that the machine administers, um, so that if you're going through a scan, you receive that amount of radiation, but there's also safety protocols for staff who are operating the machines that they need to know where they should stand, um, exactly um, how to use the machine in a safe way because it is administering radiation. And so it's very important um, for the safety of people in custody who are being subjected to the scans, but also staff operating those machines that they have been trained properly so that they don't put themselves at risk when using them. Yeah, it's, it's strange that this could happen. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for the testimony. And um, we'll be looking forward to seeing the new rules that are coming out soon, uh, sound soon, and we'll continue uh, working together. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Fred Fusco from the Connect Cor Correctional Officers Benevolent Association. Good morning, Chairman Powers. Get the mic. Sorry. I speak loud too. I'm sorry. Good morning, Chairman Powers and <clears throat> distinguished members of the uh, committee. My name is Frederick Fusco. I am the Legislative Chairman of the Correction Officers Benevolent Association, the second largest law enforcement union in the New York City area. I'm also a correction officer. We represent over 10,000 active members and over 9,500 retired correction officers. Our members, as you know, provide care, custody, and control. Over 6,000 inmates in our custody on a daily basis and over just 40,000 inmates in the last year. We are here today to discuss the topic of jail violence in New York City Department of Correction. This committee first had an oversight hearing on the issue of safety in DOC facilities back in April 23, 2018. As we expressed in testimony at that hearing and previous testimony and in press conferences, reports, and conversations with other individuals of city council members, we are eager to discuss the most important issue facing the city jails, safety and security. For the past two years, the closed Rikers debate has pushed this critical issue aside while in fact this issue should be everyone's immediate priority. New jails, whenever they are built, will never be safe and secure if the current DOC and BOC policies, which have been made by our facilities and made them, had made them much less safe, are permitted to continue. Every indicator on jail violence revered, revealed in the mayor's management report year after year has shown a steep increase in jail violence. Most concerning to our members is the 37 percent increase in assaults on correction officers last year and over the previous year. There could be no doubt there was a 37% increase in the use of force by correction officers. I must ask, would this council be in an uproar right now, as well as the city? 
In addition, there was a 3% increase on sexual assaults on female correction officers over the previous year. These figures I'm talking about are not being revealed for the first time. They have been included in the Mayor's Management Report, as I stated. They have been reported to the City Council by the DOC and BOC. They have been featured in the press, and they have been repeated time and time again by us, the COBA. Sadly, despite years of notice and continuous increases in violence, there has been no meaningful effort to stop it and to keep our correction officers safe, and as well as the civilian staff and the inmates. And while the voices of many members of this body are loud and clear expressing concern for safety of inmates, the voices expressing concern for the safety of correction officers are much more muted today. Correction officers are concerned with everyone's safety in our jails, and so should you. I want to frame my testimony today by making it very clear that decreasing jail violence and creating safer jails is not just a question of achieving the correct policy. It is a question of doing what is morally correct as well. In his 2018 State of the City address, Mayor Bill de Blasio referenced the vicious attacks that occur on correction officer Jean Saffron on February 10, 2018. The mayor said we will hold those responsible for this heinous attack fully accountable and we will take the actions necessary to protect our brave correction officers who do so much for us. We will not allow our correction officers to be assaulted, period, as well as civilian staff and as well as inmates assaulting each other. Yet somehow there was a 35 percent increase in, in assaults on correction officers last year. So there's no getting around the fact that jail violence has not decreased because the policies that have been in place have not focused on decreasing jail policy. So when you look at the assaults on correction officers, the inmate on inmate slashings and stabbings, the 150 splashing incidents last year and, and the staggering number of weapons recovered, even as the number of inmates are detained, I'm sorry, even though as the number of inmates are detained has declined and our staff has gone up, it is unmistakably clear that our current policy have only accelerated the jail violence we see today. In front of you, we had the commissioner, chief of staff, and as well as the, as the chief of the department. They spoke about their numbers, even though they sat there and they explained to us that, well, only serious injury is up 14%, but the overall number is, is extravagant. How do we get to that point when we can just talk about one portion of what's going on, when we have a 37% increase. Um, for, the, for the past four and a half years, we have heard a great deal of rhetoric about jail reform. But if you're going to impose radical reform, then that reform must be anchored by a secured system, a balance that puts law and order ahead of politics and ahead of ideology with no exceptions. The COBA will not allow correction officers to be continue to be demonized when those reforms fail. We are not shrinking from our responsibility. In fact, as evidenced by my testimony today before you, we are pro proposing more ideas on how to actually make the jail safer that I have supplied you in my written testimony. We are all asking for account a shared accountability among all the stakeholders in our criminal justice system. And that means accountability from the committee the City Council as well, ourselves, the DOC, and the BOC. The question before you is whether your allegiance is to your political ideology, should trump your obligation to do what is morally correct, or what is morally correct is making the jail safer. What is morally correct is protecting correction officers and inmates alike and giving us the tools, and nece tools necessary to do just that. What is morally correct is helping us actually reduce jail violence as opposed to just talking about our concerns in jail violence. I would like just to add, when, we, when you spoke about the adolescents, 18 to 21 year olds, those numbers come out of the chief's office, the chief that sat in front of you today. Those numbers are significant. Those numbers, even though they're our smallest class of individual that we have, they're rated in the highest uses of force. Those numbers come out of that office. But I am here today as your union to tell you what those numbers are because they affect the safety of my members. And we need to figure out what we're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I
will note that you have a number of recommendations here in the in your testimony related to sanctions, uh, 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 sanctions visits, commissary recreation, uh, splashing and spitting incidents, and a number of others. Um, I wanted to ask just a, and, and we will we'll review these, and they'll be reflected in the record as well. Thank you. Um, some of the recommendations that we had discussed earlier. Um, have related to staffing and steady staffing within the jails. I think, as you know, there was a, it appears there was a law in 2006 that allowed for, I think allowed, not required, the, the, the department to use steady staffing and to change prior, a prior law that, that did not allow it. Um, understanding there are difficulties in terms of how to make decisions around how to staff different facilities, there are considerations that are, I think, both collect, part of collective bargaining are related to how decision decisions are made. Do, is there an opportunity, or how would the department go about um, to move forward with, with, with beyond r and DC and what they're doing now to implement different staffing or steady steps with what I'm calling steady staffing here. Be, you know, it, it does seem to me just logically that an individual who has constant contact with the same person, there would be a relationship in terms of understanding them understanding you and you understanding their them and their needs. Is that something that the the union supports to, to move cl closer to a model of that? And second, what, what what challenges lie in the way of doing that? Well, first and foremost, the the wheel is not a contractual agreement. Okay, uh, bidding for steady posts, you know, there's a, there's contractual spoke. Uh, we speak about that when we when it comes to tours and posts. I think the first. Uh, idea of it is to steady up tours first before you even go and think about studying up certain areas to work in because there's so many different uh, random tours within facilities. Uh, facilities are different sizes, so that has to take into consideration as well. And then also the workload. Uh, there's different housing areas that are, are a little bit tougher than others. Uh, the same officer that comes in in a class of 200, if there's 40 officers in that facility, it would be hard to go by the seniority factor. How do we figure out who has to work here today and they're gonna steady there? Uh, the best way of going about the whole, uh, starting it all off would be bidding. Uh, how they award posts, so they would put up tours, then they would put up posts. And I think that would be the fastest way to start. Uh, as a union, we're pushing, we always promote seniority within the department for the members. But we also push to steady everybody up as far as if there is a budget in line and there is a post out there, we are always pushing the agency to post that post. It goes up for 21 days and then people will go through a bidding process to bid for it. So as we stand here and we speak about it, that's something that we've actually been promoting from day one. Staffing and manning is a managerial position for the DOC. Other than that, that's all I really can give you on that. Okay, I I, I didn't get to ask this question of the and uh, of the um, of the department that I meant to, which is um, one of the things in the Nunes report talks about the wardens. A lot of changeover in the ward wardens. I'm, you don't represent the wardens. I'm not asking you necessarily speak on their behalf, but the idea was that there are. Uh, or the impression is that there are challenges related to running the facilities um, that and and not having continuity. Staff would certainly, you know, uh, uh, all together be part of that. But do you have any insights into why there is uh, a changeover in terms of leadership at some of the at the different jail facilities on Rikers Island and in the boroughs? Well, historically, it's 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 been uh, you know from a 20-year retirement position to I, I was promoted to a warden, and I'm only speculating. Uh, perhaps that warden knows that there's no more promotions, or maybe they've done their time, so that turnover rate is a little bit higher than most areas. Uh, when I was in C-76, the sentence jail, that they're closing down now, there was four different wardens there, and it had all different uh, the types from retiring to getting promoted, uh, to an individual unfortunately going out sick. So there's all different circumstances that, that create that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have a high turnover rate. Okay. Um, the report obviously focuses on use of force and um, we're talking about both use, the use of force and also staff assaults. But, and, and your testimony obviously focuses on staff assaults. But uh, you know, when we talk about use of force and the numbers 
going in the wrong, what I, would, I think we'd all agree is the wrong direction, understanding that there's more reporting and there, and that, and there are different categories here. Um, does, the, does the union have a recommendation in terms of how to decrease the use of force across the board, but particularly in the category A? In the category A? Well, when you look at the proposals in, in my written testimony, see, everything has something to do with the other. Right, so if we have a use of force, we have to look at protocols and we have to look at um, compliance. 90% of uses of force are due to no compliance. Then there's a 10% that we have to look at in mental health, as you discussed earlier. So as long as there's rules to follow and there's compliance to follow, we can de-escalate the uses of force. In my officers, at a 10,000 and change, 43% of them are female. About 7,200 came on from 2012. We are one of the most educated law, law enforcement groups in, in the nation. My officers are smart, intelligent, they got law degrees, they got bachelor degrees. They don't wanna go to work and have to get into a use of force. They don't wanna have to go to work and get hurt. They don't wanna have to go to work and get something thrown on them. So the idea every day that they're at roll call they're just hoping to go in and making sure that day goes right. So if we give them the tools and they have the proper, as I mentioned in the proposals, the proper uh, tools to use in their toolbox, we won't be in the situation where use of force is gonna keep on going up. When you look at assault on staffs, last year it was 176 of them that were rearrested on assaults on staff. Serious injury to assaults, serious injuries, like Officer Suffrant, there was four cases of that. There was 104 rearrests on splashings, 28 on spittings. There was 15 rearrests on sexually assaults on females. How do we stop this? There has to be rulemaking. There has to be right reform, a balance. We have to hold individuals accountable. Nobody wants to go into work and mistreat anybody, no matter what side you're on. We want everybody to be safe. I, I don't disagree. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, nobody's accusing of, an, oh, I'm not certainly accusing a, not at all. any officer of coming to work deciding to be, to do harm. I think one of the issues here that the, at least the report analyzes is whether there's appropriate training in terms of de-escalation and appropriate protocol, whether they're, whether folks are, you know, and so do you have, do you have recommendations related to training? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't, no, that's for, okay. for clarity. Um, and again, I appreciate you bringing up the Correction Academy, uh, the, the gentleman of the councils. The tr Correction Academy for the last, I think you said two years, but it's been about four years. Uh, to my understanding, there's $100 million set aside. They keep kicking the can down the street, as the councilman said. We need a better facility. We need a longer academy. We need more training. See, they keep talking about programs, and they keep throwing programs out there that sound like great ideas but how many hours of training my officers get to implement those programs? See, and it's as simple as a scanner. Everybody wants to say a correction officer wasn't trained to use that scanner. But ladies and gentlemen, we do not walk in a facility and decide we're gonna go work somewhere. We're officers. There are supervisors, ADWs, deputy wardens that, that make scheduling and they put us in an area. And when an officer goes in and the supervisor is saying, no, you stay here, and I don't even know if that's the case, but one thing I can tell you, I got four delegates in each facility and they're all very diligent in their jobs. So if somebody's doing it working in an area that they shouldn't, they're not training, the first person they're gonna tell is that delegate. Then they're gonna reach out to the board member and the union's gonna come in there and re make sure that captain or that deputy warden or that supervisor removes that officer off the post that he's not trained for. So there's a lot of holes that we're dealing with, but again, BOC sits up here, the department sits up here, and nobody wants to speak about who put the officer there. Because he certainly just didn't walk in the facility and say, I'm, I'm gonna work the scanner today. I, to be fair, so, I, I, I don't know that, I'm not gonna speak for the board, I don't, know, believe, I don't believe or I don't know that that is an indictment of an individual officer. I think it's an indictment of the department, as you're noting, which is that they need to get people properly trained for the jobs that they're asking to do, including using scanners. I think the concern is making sure that the person is trained so they know how to, the, pro, the proper protocols. I don't view that as an indictment of 
office, you know, an officer who's doing it, who's doing, who's doing the job as they're told, right. and certainly would expect or hope that they would report that so that they're taken off or that. But I think that is, to me, is reflective of the department. It's not a criticism of your members, to be fair. It's a idea here that the department has to go and appropriately train people and or, or staff so that they are able to use the scanners because that is that process leads to a disciplinary process beyond that. Well, of course, and for clarity, that's why I think it was fair to mention, though, that as an officer, when they talk about officers aren't trained working in an area that they shouldn't be working in, I would just like to know how that statement exists. The question has, was imposed to them, and, and it was, and it was brought around the block a different way, but they did not answer the question. How is that officer in that area? Who put that untrained person in that area? Because that's where they have to start looking at, and that's my point. So they put programs, they put everything together, but they're not piecing together the policy and how it works. If there's a part of a policy that does not work, instead of just wiping the policy out, why don't we reform the policy? Everybody's about reform. So that's simply the point that I was just trying to make. And, and I definitely agree with you, and, I, and trust me, I, I, my gratitude to your candidates of, to the uh, BOC and the department as well with those questions that you're asking of safety for everybody and the concerns. But at the end of the day, we start talking about reforms again and, and I'm passionate about it because I am a correctional officer. But I certainly don't want an advocate looking at me today saying, well, you know what, you're because of the bad experience my family member had, or you're the one that caused that bad experience. I want to be able to give them answers like they're seeking today. They should have a balance just like my officers should have a balance. And collectively, if they just start taking things away and they're calling it reform, see, when you wipe something out and abolish it, that's not a true reform. That's a start over, like they tried to do uh, Commissioner Pond, $27 million for a start over program on Rikers Island three years ago. I haven't heard another word about the start over program. They had McKenzie Group come in and pay them $5 million off the bat. Why are we pointing the finger at those people and saying, what did you do wrong? My guys in blue, the ladies in blue that represent this, this, this beautiful city of New York, all they do is go to work hoping they can go home in the same condition they went there in. And they want to make some money to buy a house, educate their children. So when we start talking about all these things and policies that we want to change, we got to look at ourselves and say, wait a second, certain things we can't change, but we have to balance out. Let's fix it before we destroy it. The academy could go on Rikers Island. $100 million can go right to Rikers Island. $8 million that they talk about that's going to take to build borough jails, the properties on Rikers, rename it. Put another name on it, wipe it out, and I know we're not here to talk about that. But there's so many beautiful things that we can build there. We can put a trains building that's over 10,000 square feet, have different unions come in while people are incarcerated there, waiting to go to learn how to get in the union, get learn how to become a carpenter. We have plenty of officers that can be mentors. We had high impact 20 years ago that worked beautifully. There's so much we can do with the island for reform, but that's really not what the agenda is. So we have to talk about jail violence, but they also want to look forward into four years from now. How do we get back to where we are right now? How do we fix where we are right now? And that's all I'm asking every single day. Thank you for the yeah, leading. Absolutely. I think Councilor Holden had a question. Uh, right. Thanks, Mr. Fusco, for your testimony, and thank you, Chair. Um, one thing that the uh, Department of Corrections, um, I was surprised it didn't have an answer for, when they eliminate punitive segregation for the 18, 21 year olds, we're the first city in the United States to do that, they don't have the numbers to measure its effectiveness or lack thereof. I asked them, have you seen, is there a reduction in violence in that population because you're not giving them punitive seg? They don't know. That's, you would think that's the first thing they should know if they eliminate something that could jeopardize the staff, the correction officers, or other inmates. You would think they would have that answer. But you, have, you said that's the most violent population, the 18 to 21 year olds, historically? Yeah. They're, they're, the, they're the smallest population that we have out of our population, and, then, and they have the highest assaults. And I'd like to measure that now versus this, this past year, since there was no punitive seg, has it gone up, the violence, or has it gone down? We, we can't get that. They said they'll get it to me. We'll see. 
but we should have that. I, I believe the mayor's report, if you look at it, everything in there has gradually risen. The only thing, like, again, they, they want to talk about serious injury. But again, that's all about categorization. How are you going to categorize something? What, what area? Like, I don't really know who's going to say breaking a thumb is a sinju- serious injury or not. I, I really don't know how they do it. And I think that's something that we have to learn about as well. Like, how do they categorize that whole situation? Yeah. Since a lot of my colleagues seem to be asking questions on use of force, which we, I discovered today that if you just put your hand on somebody and tell them go that way, you, it's called use of force. Uh, you have to put, you know, actually tell them they're going the wrong way, you put your hand on them. That's use of force. Will you have to do a report on that? Yes, sir. And how, is it a lengthy report or? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's a detailed report describing the incident, the time, the place. Uh, who else was involved, Uh, then it will go to the supervisors, which will do their investigative report on it. Uh, And that's when we talk about uh, discipline and officers getting in trouble. There's some officers that, you know, they might have forgot that part of the training or when it changed in the directive, in the use of force directive. And they left one part of the use of force out where they, they had their hand on the person's back and they didn't review a video. So now they're getting written up because they feel like they were, the investigator feels like they're being disingenuous. But meanwhile, if they had a chance to sit there, review the video, oh yeah, I remember doing that. See, everything happens so fast. So if we have time to review what we did, but everything is considered. If somebody is leaving, doesn't want to leave a cell and you say, come on, let's go, you put your hand on, come on, let's go, pal. That's considered a use of force. Right. So was that always the case or that has, that's changed in the last? That's changed with the Nunes dissent agrees. Uh, that have come out from the Nunez lawsuit. And what year? Do you have an idea? Uh, I would have to look, but a l- recent, the last few years, the last couple It's of the years. last few years that things have changed. So if you actually touch somebody, the, uh, the arm, yeah, you have reportable. to then fill out a report for use of force. So it's changed. The standards have changed. Yes. Okay. Um, just, just one other question. Um, not training officers on the body scanners. Um, th- to me, that, and again, uh, they, they, ha- they put you on a machine and they don't train you, and they're supposed to train you by, uh, um, by all accounts. I mean, that's common sense. Did, did the officers or the union say, wait a minute, why are we putting, we don't know how to operate these machines. Did, what are you doing? Well, that's the first, yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about before. We haven't gotten those calls. We, we have a board member that covers the scanners. I dealt with the legislation of it. Uh, we have board members and delegates in every facility. We haven't had a person approach us to say, hey, look, they keep putting us on here every day. So I'm trying to figure, I can't fathom on how that data got collected. But, but isn't it consistent with what, you, what we know? We, we, get, um, um, we get reports, and I've seen the facility, the uh, training facility academy in Middle Village. It's from the 1980s. It's, it's just big, big old rooms without windows, uh, claustrophobic, in fact. Uh, substandard so they give you and it's not real life training in there um, yet you're expected to be trained and you know go into a, a facility with violent people and many time gang members where we're seeing more and more uh, gang members and just housing individuals who are from the same gang in, the, in, the, in a unit um, that also jeopardizes uh, staff, doesn't it, correction officers? Yes. When you have gang mag- members of the same gang protecting one another, right. let's say one is, is, is acting up, the correction officer has to use force, the other ones jump in. We've seen video evidence of that. We've seen some serious injuries from staff, um, correction officers who have been seriously hurt. Um, do you, do you have any comment on housing so many of the same gang in the same unit? Do you have any recommendations on that? Uh, absolutely. Smaller housing units, uh, more diverse. Uh, when you monopolize an area with so many gang members, you are left no choice if you are somebody, a detainee in that area. When there's one, uh, one correction officer for 50 inmates, 45 inmates, we, we cannot watch everything that's going on on all hours of the day. We are going to miss something, and not at our own fault. It's just the eyes, we don't have enough of them. So with what you're saying, yes, it's a, it could be very harmful to 
an individual that is not affiliated, an individual that's been in jail for the first time, is, it, it could be deemed as a, a weaker person, he could be extorted, he could be physically injured. It's, it's a bad situation. And again, if we go to get involved in something, we, we don't know who is who at that point. So now we have to be careful as an officer getting in the middle of something to break something up because we can keep, let's face it, there are gang members that stick together and they're gonna stick together in, that, in those facilities. So, so yes, we so, should. So separate. you've made, your union has made recommendations yes. and have they, done anything on that to because we obviously we're seeing the jail violence increase so no. have they responded to any of your your requests or, no. or recommendations no we've we sat at the table and we've made uh such proposals as i put in my written statement today and they still have not been played out so how often do they meet how the administration or the um uh, Cor uh, Department of Corrections meets with your union? Well, we have, a, we have a labor agreement where there's a monthly labor management for every area, every facility once a month. So at least once a month there should be a meeting. So you review the stats and every month they're up, right? The, the violence is up and yet there's no response. 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. And we have your full comments here as well, which will be uh, on the record as well. Th thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thanks again, Mr. Powers. Thank, thank you again for your time. Thank, thank you. you. We're going to call up a panel now, I think of six. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Mary Lynn uh, Worlwas. I, I can never say that. Legal Aid Society, Shari Vrad from New York County Defender Services, uh, uh, Candy from JAC, Donna Hilton from Little Place of Light, Deborah Lalai from Bronx Defenders, and Martha Grieco from Bronx Defenders. A little piece of light. I don't know what I said. A place. Okay, just give us one second. Thanks. Okay, thank you. You can begin. We'll begin over here on the right. Um, we're going to have two minutes on the clock, and uh, we will have an opportunity to ask questions afterward. So thank you. You can begin. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Powers and the committee. Um, I'm Mary Lynn Rolwas, the director of the Prisoners' Rights Project at Legal Aid Society. We hear daily from our clients who are incarcerated in the New York City jails about their suffering and about the lack of medical care and the violence at the hands of officers. We are also, to be clear, uh, plaintiff's counsel in the Nunez lawsuit that is the subject of discussion here. And both of those inform our remarks. We have provided written testimony, but want to zero right in on a few of the things that have been discussed here today. I am very grateful that the extreme paradox of our city's criminal justice system right now is being discussed here, which is this declining population of people incarcerated, and yet those who are remanded to the custody of our city jails are facing ever higher rates of violence. And this is notwithstanding four years of a federal consent decree uh, governing use of force, eight different monitors reports, not just the most recent one, detailing increasing violence and increasing incompetence in the New York City jails. We suggest the reason for this was not properly aired today. 
which is that this administration has been fundamentally unable or unwilling to address the depths of supervisory and leadership incompetence at the Department of Correction. We don't say this lightly, but it is at this point in time simply unacceptable for any governing agency, let alone an agency that is responsible for literally the lives and bodies of our New Yorkers to have this degree of institutional failure. These reports describe a failed state. They describe a crisis in governance, a crisis in accountability in New York City. And we agree with our uh, union uh, representative, pointed that the focus needs to be on the supervisors and the leadership of this department. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? that yeah. I mean, it's cl it's, the recommendations are clear in the report that this is a, uh, an issue when it comes to management and the failure to manage and appropriately train and, and make sure that frontline staff are, know the, are trained, know the use of force protocols, and are uh, in a position to be able to succeed here. What are the recommendations that you think are, that the department can make imminently to fix those issues? It imminently needs to start leading and start supervising. We hear a lot about the very front line, talk about training, we talk about the training academy. These are important things, which I'm not minimizing. Uh, the roll call training that the department uh, spoke about, which is like a pre-shift meeting, if you've ever worked in a restaurant, for example, saying here's what's going to be going on tonight. It's important. Um, what needs to happen right now and needs to happen yesterday is hearing from the department of how they're going to supervise this municipal workforce. How are they going to lead this municipal agency? Those may sound abstract, but if any of us have ever held a job, we know that actually it's not abstract, that management is a day-to-day -day function. For example, and what we would need to see, perhaps the place to start would be to go back to this issue that about the body scanners and the failures that the Board of Correction identified to the Department of Correction. Failures they should have been able to find out on their own but that the Board of Correction identified. No one sat here today and specifically said, and I think this would be a concrete thing that would be a model, like almost like a pilot for accountability in this department, to come here and say, this is a public policy that you all lobbied for years for, you drafted it for years, this was no surprise. Who was in charge of implementing it? Which white shirt? Which white shirt under them? which white shirt under them, which civilian leadership and which uniform leadership, and who failed. And let's start solving the problem there. That is not a approach we hear from the leadership in this room. Without that, until wardens and the uniform leadership of this department are standing here taking responsibility for what happens in their facilities, Honestly, the, then I think the rest of this and these reports will be useless. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna give others opportunity to, to testify and then I'll come back with questions. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Shari Vrode. I'm a senior trial attorney at the New York County Defender Services. Um, I've practiced in New York for half of my 34 years, the other half in Florida. I can tell you I've been around the circuit of jails and prisons, including death row, and Rikers is by far, anecdotally, without research, the most violent. I practice in court, I have my clients to come into court regularly with slashes down their face, and I'm, I'm, this is the clientele that I'm dealing with, slashes down their face, numerous stitches, families up in arms, and I feel powerless to help because that's just the sort of, um, in the sort of, I don't, I can't think of an appropriate word, um, the sort of violent atmosphere that they have at Rikers. And I think that everybody at Rikers, inmates and staff included, have descended into this sort of savagery because it's just sort of an acceptable thing in that environment. I just want to tell you about one really, really egregious case. Um, I had a client who came into court in arraignments. Um, he was talking word salad. He might have called me an animal, um, not in a bad way, but thought I looked like an elephant. Um, I couldn't talk 
talk to him. I couldn't find out what was going on, but he was charged with a violent felony. I asked for a 730 review to see if he was fit to stand trial. Five days later, he was attacked in Rikers. Just a chop across the neck, but everything was idiosyncratic. He lay in his cell for seven days on end, nobody looking after him. He couldn't move. At the end of the seven days, he was taken over to Bellevue, and he had neurosurgery, and he was a quadriplegic. This is impossible. I was the only person. This is a horror story. It's a tragedy. It's a truth. I was the only person who went to visit him. I was appalled. It's, it's um, influenced my practice over the past number of years. Now, this when, really, when, yeah. was that, when was that, though? That was May of 2019, not long ago. And he's actually calling me now as I'm testifying because he's back in Rikers. And you were talking about the confluence, um, Commissioner, um, of you know, psychiatric problems and so on and so forth. Obviously, this guy had psychiatric problems, but the upshot of it all was at the end. It wasn't glass bottles, it wasn't physical injury, it wasn't a violent felony. It was at best a misdemeanor where he threw plastic Snapple bottles causing no physical injury, should not have ended up in Rikers in the first place. Thank you for your Thank day. you. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Candy, a.k.a. Solitary Survivor. Surviving. I was in solitary for over three years as a detainee waiting trial for a speedy trial. And I hear everyone talking about gangs. Um, I was beat and abused by the Department of Corrections. The officers are the gang. They are the ones that gang raped me, gang abused me. They're the ones that did not give me toilet tissue. They're the ones that, that gave me supplies to commit suicide and told me to hurry up because they have eight hours until the body gets cold. And I keep hearing them say, gang this, gang that. But if you want to be honest, Officers are affiliated with gangs, too. I saw an officer, she did not want to take my post as a suicide, I was on suicide watch, and she was a crip. She didn't want to take my post because the other officer was a blood, and they were arguing about it. So gangs are also affiliated with DOC. They, okay, they have bachelor's degrees, okay, they have um, um, uh, um, attorney degrees, as he said, but they also are representing red, yellow, blue, gang colors. They are the gang, and it needs to be stopped. Every day I have nightmares because of the gangs beating on me, the gangs raping me. I never had problems with the inmates. It was the officers that took everything from me. It was the officers that took my soul from me. Thank you for listening to me. I'm trying to put three years into two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna try to do this in two minutes. Um, my name is Donna Hilton. Approximately 35 years ago in 1985, as an adolescent, I was sent to Rikers Island to await pretrial and trial proceedings. I had never been in jail prior. I'd never had any interactions with law enforcement in the capacity of a so-called criminal or juvenile delinquent. My only interaction with the law was to report my, uh, my abduction, rape, and abuse by an older man. I was 16 years old. That interaction left me distrusting and afraid. The detective who handled my case carried out his own brand of justice. He raped me right after taking me to the hospital to treat be treated for burns and contusions. Even so, I did not believe all law enforcement officials and agencies were bad. I held on to the belief that there were some good people, good adults in this world, until I was detained on Rikers Island. I was placed into protective custody, what is also called administrative segregation, for a reason yet to be explained to me. I was isolated and alone, afraid, hungry, and experiencing nightmares which left me sleep deprived as I was afraid to go to sleep. I was 20 years old. I told a correctional officer some days later uh, what was going on, and they took me to the social service unit to be screened. I cannot tell you what the screening process was. All I can say is that a later, later, a correctional officer brought me medication and told me I had to take it because it was an order. I did as I was told because it was more 
It was an order, not advice. I later found out that it was psychotropic medication, Cinequan. I became extremely delusional, more afraid, swollen and numb. So uh, swollen, numb, and dehydrated that I had no other choice but to go into the toilet to get water to uh, put on my lips. I asked to be taken off the medication. Staff told me no and that I had to get a court order. I told my attorney and was told there's no such order and no such practice. Months later, I returned from court to be moved to the big, AKA solitary confinement, which actually was only a cell three doors down from the one I was currently in. All this happened as I was going through um, the judicial process, fighting to be heard, fighting to be understood, and fighting for justice, fighting for my adolescent life. But before I was released, I was released from the Bing, I was let out for one hour wreck, and as I was in the recreation room, uh, I saw a movement out the corner of my eye, and the officer who was in the control bubble at the time had let another woman in into the recreation area and did not let me out. I saw that young woman, because she was young just like me, you take her cup, put it under the sink where the boiling, scalding hot water is that we use to make tea, soup, and coffee. And I saw a motion like it was, she was gonna throw it at me. And for whatever reason, my instincts kicked in, thankfully, and I prevented her from burning my face to, um, beyond recognition. And the officer, I promise you, set up that scenario. I can't say much more because my time is limited, but I will say that as, as I've heard today, we also have friends and family that are correctional officers. We also have friends and family who are correctional officers who say the violence needs to stop. There is a culture of violence on Rikers Island that is beyond our imagination. I promise you, most of you in this room will not be able to, to live through it. It takes you someplace else. You have no other choice but to be violent to survive. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Deborah Lalloy, and I'm the supervising attorney of the LGBTQ Defense Project at the Bronx Defenders. Each year, I represent hundreds of transgender people who are facing criminal charges, many of whom are or have been incarcerated. Over the past several years, much attention has been paid to the abuse of transgender people who are incarcerated in city jails, and many improvements have been made. However, there are many transgender incarcerated people whose needs continue to be unmet and whose safety is compromised. For example, many transgender women continue to be housed in men's jails against their will. The factors that DOC considers to determine placement are problematic and often use past incidents where transgender people were defending themselves as a reason to deny them housing consistent with their gender identity. DOC continues to suggest that some transgender people who don't fit stereotypical gender norms are pretending to be transgender, and transgender men are always housed in women's facilities because a safe alternative does not exist for them. I'd like to share one of our clients' recent experiences. Mr. Celestine is a transgender man who entered into custody in October 2019. He started off at the men's intake facility. No one knew he was transgender until an officer recognized him and outed him to all the other officers and started arguing about where he should be placed, all in front of the cisgender men Mr. Celestine was sharing a cell with in that moment. In Mr. Celestine's own words, quote, I could have been safely housed in the men's jail, but the officers were the ones who made it unsafe for me. They put a target on my back, end quote. He was transferred to Rose M. Singer Center where he would endure endless humiliation, harassment, and abuse. He was housed in a general population unit with only cisgender women who would not allow him to shower in peace and would constantly harass him. He applied to be housed in the Special Consideration Unit, but his application was denied multiple times because DOC, quote, did not want him to become pregnant, end quote. He was constantly misgendered and his pronouns were routinely intentionally ignored. One day, Mr. Celestine asked an officer to stop calling him Miss, and she responded with, quote, you know you are in a female facility and in order to be here, you need to be female. I'll prove it to you that you are a female, end quote and proceeded to forcibly pull down Mr. Celestine's pants in public. 
There were many, many more incidents as horrific as this one, and it took a severe toll on his mental health. He began struggling with the worst dysphoria he had experienced in years and began to have suicidal thoughts. Wait, we just need you to bring it. Sure. Mr. Celestine's story is unfortunately not uncommon. Again, we recognize the significant improvements that DOC has made. However, a lot of work remains to be done to ensure the safety of all trans, gender non-conforming, intersex, and non-binary people in the custody of the Department of Corrections. Thank you. And just before I, uh, we move on to the next testimony, it's something we had done a hearing on, uh, I think it was last year, really to specifically on the THU, and uh, ensuring, trying to ensure there was an appeals process to your housing decision that was separate from those who were making the decision in the first place. I know there's been some uh, changes in the rules, and we, I still have a bill related to it, but um, we still would like to make sure that that process works the way it's intended to, which is that you have, you have different people making different decisions about housing. The second thing I would note is we went to see some of the training last year, and when you specifically talk about the trans population there, there was a uh, very, I think we were all quite surprised in terms of how the training uh, dealt with, uh, I think it was quite outdated in terms of the training and particularly the attitude that was given towards that. And um, it is one thing to, you can say we have the training in place, it's different how you actually do it and how the people who are performing it uh, uh, to other officers are giving it. And I think that is one area that we believe the department has a long way to go in terms of shifting attitudes and understanding of how people identify and, and um, particularly you know, reducing phobia around uh, populations that people may not understand or um, and to, to provide very good. So something we will follow up with you on, particularly around how to, um, how to fix some of the policies and culture around that as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the council. My name is Martha Greco. I'm also at the Bronx Defenders. I'm one of the Bronx Defenders' first prisoners' rights attorneys, and I'm also um, a criminal defense attorney. The Department of Correction routinely imposes forms of torture on people. 24-hour isolation, shackles, mitts, loss of visits with loved ones, even extensions of a person's sentence as a purported resolution to conflict in the jails. I'm gonna to talk today to the council about a particular um, solution which is access to counsel in disciplinary hearings. When DOC decides who's responsible for a violent incident, there's no real due process, no check on their narrative. Every single person in the jails already has a lawyer, yet those lawyers are not allowed to represent them in hearings that result in these extreme punishments. At the Bronx Defenders and at probably every public defender office in the city, lawyers already follow their clients to ancillary hearings that are not necessarily part of their criminal defense case, such as hearings at the DMV, hearings at Oath, hearings at the TLC. Advocates should be able to represent their clients in disciplinary hearings as well. Yet many people we visited in punitive segregation report confusion as to why they're even there. Many are serving owed box time from an incident they were involved in many months before. Our attorneys have no access to the paperwork DOC is supposed to give someone explaining their conviction and sentence. Clients report to us that they're being punished as much as nine to 10 months after their infraction and they are understandably frustrated. If someone is placed in solitarily unlawfully, there's little that the person can do to self-help. Attorneys visiting a client in solitary confinement, that's even more onerous than the already trying process of visiting a client in the general <laughs> population. On average, when our attorneys visits cl visit clients who are in solitary, they wait two to three hours just to begin the interview. Materials from the law library are supposed to be available to people in solitary units to allow them to write to the warden, to appeal their infraction, to file writs, but every single client in solitary reports to us that their requests for law library materials are denied. When it comes to representation at disciplinary hearings, New York is actually well behind the curve. I have in my uh, report a number of states that already implement this, but especially I want New York City to look at Washington, D.C. as a model. The public defenders in Washington, D.C. have an entire unit of their office devoted to reentry and advocacy for incarcerated people, including representing them at disciplinary hearings at the jail, and they meet regularly with the DOC commissioner in a friendly exchange of information. It's not so novel. Denying incarcerated people due process is counterproductive to the goal of reducing violence in the jails. Our clients are experiencing the torture of 24-hour 
24-hour isolation and they rarely understand why. They're shackled to a desk and they don't understand why. They're wearing mitts 24 hours, 14 hours a day and they don't understand why. They can't explain their side of things to anyone. The powerlessness that people feel in custody is the root of the harm and the root of the violence. The support of an advocate, even just to help demystify some of what's happening to people during disciplinary hearings would make a tremendous difference. Our clients feel completely ignored there and that's because they are. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to just ask some follow-up questions on that topic because it's something we've been we've discussed with the department around uh, access to representation. Um, number one is well, I just want to start by saying on the on the library side of this, I, I, I suppose law library and and normal library are different from each other. But we had a hearing, I think it was last year, related to access and solitary or punitive segregation related to library and access to materials. Councilmember Holden and Councilmember Drum had both. Uh, pushed very hard on the department to provide more resources when it comes to library. I don't think we honed in on particularly law library, but um, services. They had then come back to us the next day saying, I think, it was, I think it was the next day or maybe the same day, saying they would agree to start providing those services to individuals who are in punitive segregation. If you want to send us follow-up information that proves that otherwise, we'd be happy to follow up on that point. It's something that came out, I think it was a hearing last year in 250, and uh, both Councilor Holden and Drum had uh, had uh, persuaded the department to change its policy related to some access to materials. On the access to counsel, one of the uh, uh, replies or comments back when we've talked about this with the uh, mayor's office and the department has been funding resources and um, challenges related to providing that, um, although potentially could look at it in a smaller basis as an, an opportunity to analyze those. Can you tell us what, do, 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 does like, do organizations have the funding to be able to provide that today? What, and then also when it comes to challenges related to, uh, to that with, you know, sort of providing that within the correctional system here in New York City, can you talk about? Sure. Yeah. Well, there's a difference between appointed counsel and just access to counsel. We're not asking for appointed counsel because people already have lawyers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when I follow one of my clients who's facing a criminal charge to the DMV, that's not some extra service that I'm providing. There's no extra payment for that. That's just part of what it means to do holistic defense. So this isn't, again, this isn't saying the city must provide brand new lawyers. It's not saying that the hearing cannot occur if their lawyer is not available. And in fact, in DC, it's a best efforts. You know, the attorney makes the best effort to appear at the hearing. The hearing will go on unless, you know, they can make some sort of agreement that can be adjourned. Um, but we're not actually asking for appointed counsel. We're just asking for access to counsel that they already have. Okay. Are there any other particular challenges you see into this? this I mean, you're, you're basically, as you're saying, you're basically saying let your, you're let your lawyer today be able to be your lawyer when it comes to these disciplinary hearings. What are other challenges that might be standing in the way of that? I, I don't see any challenges. I mean, I go to Rikers every single week. There's shuttles. Um, there's the family bus that leads from, leaves from Harlem. A shuttle leaves uh, from 10 minutes from where I live in Brooklyn every day. There's one that leaves from every single borough. Um, in terms of transportation, that's actually improved immeasurably over the past 10 years. The biggest challenge is when I go to visit a client in solitary confinement is how many hours it takes to put that person in a booth. Mm. Um, so the challenge is really from DOC's perspective in getting people uh, into the room. But well, you know, well, but parole yeah. attorneys meet with their clients privately before their parole hearings at the Judicial Center. Um, there's already writ court where people meet with their attorneys if they're appealing their infraction, if they're, they've done the first level of appeal and have actually gotten to a third and fourth level of appeal. So you know, there's attorneys there. It's, there's already a structure in place. There's already a judicial center. It's just permission. I understood. I had there has been discussion around what their challenges may be in terms of access and things like that, but something we're certainly interested in and will follow. But I think even in, in the uh, testimony that I provided to the Board of Corrections related to, to punitive segregation changes, we had discussed, you know, even in a sort of starting point basis, allowing for representation to analyze whatever those challenges or resources challenges may be. Um, so th thank you all for your testimony, and we're going to call up the next Welcome. panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have um, Sarifa Daftery, Zachary Katz Nelson, Fidel Guzman, Guzman, Brooke Menchel, Donald Powell, 
Raymond Ortega and Melissa Clark. Thank you. You can start over here. Uh, which will actually give us what you guys? Okay. Sure. I'll give you two minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll, so and we'll get you one more chair. Thanks. So my name is Ashley Darlene Jackson. I'm speaking on behalf of Sarita who had to, um, okay. So I'm going to no submit my, my written testimony okay. online. Um, so this testimony is uh, on behalf of Anna, who is a Close Rikers campaign leader. Uh, my name is Anna. I visited my son each weekend for six years from two from 2010 to 2016, while he was held preacher on Rikers Island. The weekend trips to that infamous island have, has affected me for the rest of my life because my son and I witnessed the violence and endured abuse from correction officers on multiple occasions. I have encountered very nice and humane correction officers. It is unfortunate that they are outnumbered by the majority of violent, aggressive, abusive, ignorant, and inhumane officers. My visits became my nightmares because each time I went to Rikers Island, I either suffered some kind of abuse or witnessed abuse toward others by the officers. Each time I prayed that nothing extreme would happen, I witnessed a lot of violence that should have been de-escalated by the officers. Instead, they loved to instigate violence between others and I had fun watching it. I was stripped and searched many times in front of other female visitors while they were waiting to be stripped and searched too. The female correction officer who searched us seemed to take pleasure in yelling orders at visitors. She made us open up our pan zippers and expose our crotches, pull up our sweaters to expose our stomachs and back, shake our bras out before an officer had hand squeezed our breasts. We had to remove socks to expose our feet and legs, let them search inside of our mouths and run their hands through our hair. This procedure was part of that routine at the GMDC building prior to entering the visit room. On other occasions, I was randomly stripped and searched in a special room where I had to remove my clothes to prove that I had no contraband. These practices made me very angry, shameful, and depressed. A few times while in the visiting room at the AMKC building, I have witnessed five officers pull visitors from the main room and beat them on the claim that he was passing drugs to detainees. I remember that it took the entire one hour visit for an ambulance to arrive and help the visitors who was dripping blood from his face and head. I witnessed male visitors being denied a visit because of a small crack on their ID cards or for minor misuses, which were escalated by the officers. When visitors complain and ask to please be let into the visit room, this is, okay, so this is, do you, so <laughs> you can submit it and we'll put it on the record for okay you so well. the last uh, let me just read the last sentence okay. which she put i'm sorry um so i truly believe that doc cannot be reformed or retrained their abusive ways are embedded in their culture of violence which has gone beyond what is considered acceptable the only way to remove the violence from new york city jails is to completely remove and dissolve the doc once and for all thank you Hey, good afternoon. I'm Zachary Katz Nelson with the Lippman Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I just want to say uh, there's been some discussion. Chair Powell has asked about resources the department might need. This is, as, as I'm sure you know, the most heavily resourced, richly resourced department in the world, probably. Now, officers, 1.7 officers roughly today for every single person incarcerated. That is absolutely unheard of. And so the resources are already in the department if they're needed at all. I'd also note that more and better training always welcome, but the officers have been trained. Even the de-escalation training that's discussed, they've received that already in the academy. It's a slightly different version the department talked about today. They just aren't putting it to use. It really is about accountability, about management, about oversight. Uh, a few ideas about what they could do. Consolidate operations. Have as few jails as absolutely possible. The fewer jails you need, the fewer, fewer jails, jails you have, the fewer management teams you need. Actually get, let them get a grip on things. They spread people far too thin, moving wardens around all the time to put out fires. 
concentrate the resources where they're needed. Immediately analyze staffing in every unit. When I go to Rikers, I see officers standing around in the hallway, sometimes upwards of a dozen, and a single officer is in a housing unit with dozens of people who are incarcerated. That should not be. Everyone has to be not just assigned to steady post, but actually work those posts. That's not what actually happens today. Even people who have a steady post, they don't actually work that post day to day. We need to have cohesive teams, hold everyone accountable, get to know each other. That's how teams work in life, not just in the DOC. A few other things that some have mentioned already, but what about something else? What about putting DOC leadership in the jails instead of keeping them in Bulova? What about violence and interrupters in every unit of every jail? It's only been done on a pilot basis. And this is not just all in the Department of Correction. Parole authorities lock up now a quarter of people in Rikers are there for accused of parole violations. The city should do everything it can to put pressure on the state, not to lock so many people up on parole for so little. And the last thing I'd mention is that people who are drivers of violence, often according to DOC, are people that have been there an incredibly long time. DOC used to meet repeatedly with district attorneys to say, why can you not speed up these cases. That needs to be a priority for judges, for district attorneys, and for defenders as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Brooke Menschel. I'm the Civil Rights Counsel with the Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you to the committee and Chair Powers for the opportunity to come today and share some of the reports we regularly hear from the people we represent. We're all very well aware of the findings of the Nunez Monitor, which, of course, as we all know, reported the highest rates of use of force since the Monitor has been in place. The Department's response that we heard this morning was disheartening. They attempted to undermine the data and claim by, in part by claiming that use of force is not equal to violence. But we should make no mistake, use of force is the very definition of violence. In the face of the department's efforts to minimize the report and justify violence in the jails, it's hard to believe their statement that they take its findings seriously. We routinely hear evidence of the failure to reduce the violence in the jails. The department claims that nowhere in, the in DOC can something happen without being recorded because the facilities are blanketed with cameras, but that's simply not true, or at least it's not true that the cameras are always working. We hear at least weekly reports of officer misconduct in, in areas that don't have cameras, or at the very least where the cameras are not working. We hear regular reports of pushing, shoving, and grabbing by officers in response to, to minimal verbal misconduct. We hear frequent incidents where officers subject people to chemical spray as retribution for insubordination. And on a daily basis, we hear reports of people who are placed in isolation as retaliation for insubordination, which in turn perpetuates the cycle of violence. We hope that the city will view the Nunez report as a call to action. We urge the city council to be a leader in the charge, to push for the monitor's recommendations to be integrated into department policies, contracts, and where possible into council legislation, to support the Board of Corrections efforts to adopt revised minimum standards and encourage the board to ensure strict limits on restrictive housing, to insist that the department reduces its reliance on tactics that perpetuate violence, specifically chemical spray and isolation, and instead recognize officers who successfully employ de-escalation um, tactics. And certainly, we also uh, support the implementation of a program that would allow representation at disciplinary hearings and would welcome the opportunity to be a part of any conversation about the resources and the uh, mechanisms that we can put in place to allow that to happen. Thank you for the opportunity to address this. Thank you. Good afternoon. The Children's Defense Fund would like to thank you, Chair Powers, and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Melissa Clark, and I am the Youth Justice and Child, Wear, Child Welfare Policy Associate at Children's Defense Fund New York. At Children's Defense Fund, our mission and sole purpose is to ensure that every child receives a healthy start, fair start, safe start, and moral start at life so that they can achieve a successful passage into adulthood and their communities. We serve on the Department of Corrections Youth Advisory Committee and our Freedom School Summer Literacy Program serves youth in the Administration for Children's Services Detention Facility, Horizon. With that mission in mind, I'm here to speak for the youth who are behind the walls, experiencing extreme violence while in the city's custody. The Department of Correction manages eight facilities on Rikers. 
On Rikers Island, individuals of all age groups are experiencing violence. However, young people between the age of 16 and 18 are experiencing violence at a much higher rate than their adult peers. DOC's use of force against adolescents and young adults rates have reached the highest they have ever been since 2016. In the adult jails, young adults aged from ages 18 to 21, the use of force against them have increased 174%. The department's use of force against young people 18 years of, 18 years of age has reached the highest it's ever been since 2016 at 202%. The states raised the age law allow for us to begin to remedy a, a, a culture of violence that has harmed our young people in unspeakable ways. As a result of this law, 16 and 17 year olds who were once incarcerated on Rikers were relocated to Horizon Juvenile Center. However, the declining youth population, however, with the declining youth population, the violence that our young people are experiencing continues to rise. The Federal Monitor reported that the use of that the use of force that, that the DOC staff uses against young people was higher in June 2019 than any than any period since the adoles adolescents were moved to Horizon. It is essential that the DOC makes progress towards its obligation to move away from these failed tactics and move with more urgency to better support our young people. Thank you for holding this hearing and focusing attention on the lack of safety for our young people in jails. Great, thank you, thanks for being here. Good afternoon, Chairperson Powell and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. My name is Donald R. Powell, and I've worked for the last decade at Exponents, a nonprofit organization which provides critical services for individuals living with HIV, those struggling with substance use and other behavioral health conditions, and persons incarcerated or recently released from New York City jails. On behalf of Exponents Board of Directors, dedicated staff, and our participants, I thank you for organizing this hearing and permitting me to testify as someone who has firsthand experience with New York City jail-based violence. While I am certain we will hear and have heard additional testimony that highlight the atrocities of violence in our city jails, I would like to point out that my story took place almost 30 years ago. Let that be a wake-up call that this is not an issue that has just surfaced in recent years. While being detained in the Otis Bantam Correctional Facility, I was sexually harassed by an inmate repeatedly and eventually attacked by him and three other inmates in the stairway on my way from breakfast. When I was able to break free and run up the stairs toward my housing unit with my assailants in pursuit, the housing officer closed and locked the door and would not reopen it. I was attacked again. In the last six months, we've witnessed the death of Laylene Polanco, a 27-year-old transgender woman with a history of epilepsy found dead in her cell in the segregated housing unit, and Nicholas Feliciano, an 18-year-old Latinx male from Queens who attempted suicide after being attacked by several other inmates. Why was this young man, arrested for a technical parole violation, housed in complex with the highest security classification, despite the Young Adult Directive mandate to separate those classified as young adults, be detained separately from their older counterparts? Why was he left in his cell for several hours after his attack instead of being referred for immediate medical attention? How do stewards of care, custody, and control stand by for almost seven minutes watching camera feed of him attempting to hang himself before making a decision to intervene? I share this painful story to underscore the non-negotiable fact that neglect and abuse of power are also forms of violence. As a black man with justice involvement, I am proud of the reforms that we've made thus far. I look forward to a time where I can literally see with my eyes open the closing of Rikers Island. I am concerned, though, that if we don't come up with solutions to excessive force, mistreatment of our youth offenders, sexual exploitation of those detained, and a lack of culturally responsive services for those among us daily managing severe mental illness, we will witness the same atrocities in the borough-based facilities that we've seen and heard testified here at Rikers Island. If it is true, indeed true that the mark of a society can be measured by how we treat our brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters involved in criminal justice system, we have a far way to go. Thank you. Great, thank you. My name is Vidal Guzman. I'm a community organizer for the Closed Rikers Campaign. I experienced violence in New York City jails, the Manhattan Tombs, Rikers Island. Violence inside our jail is not different from violence in our communities because people in jail are people from our communities. First, as a person who was formerly incarcerated and also a former member of the Bloods, um, I lived the effect of violence and seen the ripple effects of violence in my community. I have watched some individuals, individuals come home from jail and prison and be more violent when they went in. Instead of blaming them, the real question I asked myself, what's going on with them? Are we doing enough? And I also know that violence is caused by trauma of those who witnessed this and lived in fear of it. 
I lived on a block that was beefing with a housing complex blocks away from each other. We was, that beef set, started in 2000, um, and it was just done, um, and, and peace and peace treaty was actually created in 2012 while I was actually upstate. Um, this beef kept going on for years, fights between jails in Rikers Island, Green Correctional Facility, and other different, Sing Sing and other different facilities, right? Um, that was into individuals who was in prison took a chance, uh, took, a, took a chance to take action. They took us to start this program called Alternative to Violent uh, Program, it's AVP, it's an international program that creates conflict resolution based on affection and respect for all community and cooperation and trust. They had people who was incarcerating, leading, and facilitating the workshops in Green Crusher facilities. In these workshops, we learned about personal growth, community development, conflict, uh, created conflict uh, management, founded in prison, developed from real life experience of detainees. AVP encouraged every person to grab and, and gain the power to positively transform them first, themselves, and then the world that we lived in. A turn into violent program brought together diversity groups of people, including active and former gang members to, uh, to end violence. So while I was in Green Crush facility, I was still active, a high-ranking member of the Bloods, and I was actually facilitating with someone who was our Aryan Nation Brotherhood. Um, and I think I wanna end, I have two things, because I know it's really finishing. Credible messages OG across the country has worked to not just ending violence, but helping young people in our community inside while they were incarcerated to become mentors for them. In New York City, we have a Cure Violence program that have been doing a great job in our community. Been, uh, we know that the most people accused of violent act has experienced real trauma and violent very often in their life. The lines between nonviolent victim uh, are really non-existing. These lines only exist so the power in the system holds power. Police, prosecutors, COs can exercise their power and control over people they choose to target. And we believe everyone has access to hell and justice and equity. And this is what we should, and I, and I think this is not, and I haven't really heard this, because one, I want to make sure that when we talk about gang members, um, I, my block is Bloods, Crips, Denny, Thalios, um, and there is no war, no, it's strictly peace. Um, and I think in reality, we can actually create peace tr uh, treaties in our neighborhoods, then we could create peace treaties in outside our jail system. It's time for us to end the, 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 our war, uh, the city or this country's war between the Bloods and the Crips, um, and we are able to do that. People who are detained, and incarcerated need access to leadership, opportunity to learn the importance of being a leader while incarcerated and in the community. Successful reentry begins from the moment someone enters the system. Learning how to participate in an advocacy campaign and learn how laws affect their community, we can create an individual blueprint, success while people are inside jail, offer space for, for art expression, resources for learning, and other opportunity for youth, adults, and their family who are just as involved. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Raymond Ortega. I'm 18 years old and live in Fort Rockway. I would like to thank you, Chair Powers, and the members of the Committee on Criminal Justice for the opportunity to testify today. I am a research assistant with the Youth Justice Collaborative Initiative and work alongside great organizations like the Children's Defense Fund. I am here today to speak about the violence youth experience in city jails and detention centers. The youth experience in jail is not much difficult than an adult. Teens are still experiencing the same levels of violence and horizons as they did on Rikers Island. Even though moving the youth from Rikers to Horizons was done to provide a more structured and secure facility where young people could feel safe and protected, that has not been the experience for many young people. Young people may experience situations where brutal force is used against them even though they're teenagers. This shows a lack of concern for the traumatic experiences that young people may be facing every day. So I'm here today to ask all the members of the committee on criminal justice to investigate the harm being done to teenagers while incarcerated in these facilities. To seek out the answer to this issue in order to help our future policemen and women, doctors, lawyers, and teachers to allow them to serve their time in the safe haven as they was promised. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for all the testimony. I just had a one, Follow-up question here, uh, and thank you for everybody for sharing your stories as well. Um, just well, two things. One is I think two folks had mentioned. I know the Litman Commission. I think somebody else mentioned ways to uh, celebrate or have positive 
uh, uh, to, 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 to be positive around folks who are staff who help counteract violence or reduce it. Uh, are there measures by which one, like how, how does that actually happen when in, in, in real life? I think some of the things the chief mentioned, but they could be doing much more. They mentioned employee of the month, for instance. There are going to be so many employees of the month, but hopefully there are more staff that are actually stopping violence day to day. The key is for the captain, for instance, on every shift, if someone has done something good, call the people together at the end of the shift and say they've done something good. Use each shift as a learning opportunity, not this roll call once a week. This should be a day in, day out lesson from the people who are in leadership, and that needs to be at every level captains, ADWs, deputy wardens, wardens, everybody, use every opportunity to praise and praise publicly, and that's not done right now. And, oh, do you wanna? Yeah, can I just add one thing? And I think in addition to that, we routinely see that officers who are involved in um, violence or in other things that we would certainly consider to be misconduct end up advancing through the ranks, and they're and so being able to highlight those people who are effectively using de-escalation tactics and putting them forward first so that they're the ones who are advancing into leadership will be a really critical component of the culture change that I think we all recognize we need. Okay, thank you. And when we talk about violence interrupters in the, in the units of the jails, that, that's a pilot that has been a pilot program? It's, can still, it's discontinued or it's still ongoing? It, I'm not sure the extent it still continues. It was a pilot. It was then abandoned. The department had talked about bringing it back, but I haven't heard anything definite recently about it actually happening. Okay. Can you tell us follow-up information on that? Absolutely. Thank you. And, to, and my last question, uh, this is to Vidal, who talked a little bit uh, you know, about the connection between a neighborhood and, yeah. and then our city jails and upstate. Um, can you talk about existing efforts in the city right now to do that, to do to, that are looking? I mean, th there's obviously yeah. a number of programs in the city. I, I think one thing that we can kind of follow is the Jail Action Coalition, their blueprint and solitary. It talks about harm reduction in a way that we as a uh, correctional and also advocates can agree of how do we push from uh, uh, isolation place as solitary confinement that harms people. And I think one of the most important things, well, I was, uh, uh, when I did three and a half years, I also did 905 days in solitary confinement. And the reason why I say that, um, before I became a, a facilitator for AVP, on turning into violent program, you should look it up. They have a thousand facilitators who are directly impacted and been through the, and, and are incarcerated and are other individuals who are facilitating the classes. And I know on Rikers Island they tried to put AVP, but the Department of Correction did not like the way that was handled because they found out that the individual detained is the one that's facilitating. Um, so there was a, a, a power structure that they didn't like that was happening there. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for your testimony and your patience. Thank you. So our last uh, a panel here, we have uh, Sandra Cadero from Just Leadership, Jennifer Parrish from Urban Justice Center, Alexa Adams from Urban Justice Center, Brandon Holmes from Just Leadership, uh, Victoria Phillips from Mental Health Project and J Jails Action Coalition, Herbert Murray from Just Leadership, and Kelly Grace Price from Close Roses. Good, thank you. Uh, we're getting your testimony, but you can, you can begin. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, how you doing? My name is Sandro Cordero. I'm here with Justice Lead Leadership, uh, Close Rikers Island. Uh, I'm here on behalf of myself just to say, you know, speak on like, my experience in Rikers Island as a youth. And um, all I gotta say is that Rikers Island was a contribution of violence back to the community because what they taught in there was that violence is what makes the world go round and what controls everything around us. And people that come from the street, and especially in certain urban environments, they actually grow up around this. So when you, you end up in a place like Rikers Island, they actually justify that type of mentality, you know, and they actually confirm it and, and they actually solidify it. 
And my personal experience also in Rikers Island as a youth was, you know, I've, I've been incarcerated, I've been in uh, s segregation, and uh, I've been assaulted by the officers. Like in previous uh, encounters, one encounter was when my, I had a fractured wrist, and I went to the hospital, you know, and I was in full restraints, you know, leg shackles, hand shackles, and one of the, the officers was talking with one of the officers and they was basically expressing about their they beliefs and how they feel that inmates, oh, I'm, I'm talking loud, oh. And they, you know, they, they was it was two officers and they was talking on their beliefs about how they feel that inmates are getting it too easy and how certain inmates, they need to bring the death penalty and this and that and you know, and they have the conversation and they actually, one of the officers used me as an example and I actually got involved in the, in, 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 in the discussion and we got into like a verbal disagreement or whatever the case might be. So it left off when the officer told me that he's gonna see me when it's time to go back. Basically when it's time to go back in transportation is when they was gonna pull the, you know, the full restraints back on with the belts and all that. So make a long story short, I was sleeping. It was like what, two, three in the morning when my transportation came. And all I know is when I opened my eyes, I just see the officer and two of them rushed me and grabbed me. So when they grabbed me, they threw me down and one pinned me while the other one was on top of me, you know, hitting me, hitting me, and then another one grabbed my legs because I had the shackles, and he pulled me so I could just be laid straight on my back, and they would just keep beating me, keep beating me, and, you know, I was just so, like, I didn't expect it, and they ain't stop until a female officer actually couldn't take the blood and scream to the top of her lungs and just said, stop, but it was a while after it went on, and then after that, they trying to clean it up, they kept me hidden, they didn't want me to make no phone calls. They told my parents, my mother, that I wasn't even in the building. They gave her the runaround. They didn't even want me to make personal calls in there. And the only way I was able to see my parents eventually was, you know, I had to get support from the outside to reach out, you know, to the reporters and stuff like that. And then my lawyer went and got a, you know, long story. But just, just to say that my experiences there, it just, it, it just was, how to put it, it what it showed me was that it, all they do is, is, is teach more violence and teach them and it just teach people that being humane is just being that way sometimes where you got to just be a certain type of aggression or just be cold hearted towards another human being. And I truly believe that Rikers Island is a regime that need to get broken up because it's a traditional way they got it running from centuries where they believe that this is a certain way they got to deal with prisoners and you know it's like a gang itself. You know what I mean? They call people in the street gang, but Rikers Island is a gang itself. And they got a serious code. And like I said, it, sh it should really get broken up. And, you know, but uh, I just hope for the future that things could get better. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Parrish. I'm the Director of Criminal Justice Advocacy at the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project. I'm also a member of the Jails Action Coalition and the Halt Solitary Campaign, and a member of the Department of Correction Crisis Intervention Team Advisory Board. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Today I want to focus on one intervention for reducing violence with respect to people with mental health concerns, the use of crisis intervention teams. This intervention is a solution that has shown promise. Unfortunately, Department of Correction leadership has not embraced and fully implemented CIT. In November 2014, the Mayor's Task Force on Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice included the development of CIT in its recommendation for ensuring that people with behavioral health disorders in the jails receive treatment that is therapeutic rather than punitive. The CIT model was originally designed to improve the police response to mental health crisis, but in 2015, the city adapted CIT to the jail setting. CIT in the jails consists of Department of Correction and health staff who've received a five-day training that includes education regarding mental health symptoms and methods of de-escalation. And one of the key features of this training is role-playing mental health, mental health crisis situations with actors. Staff have the opportunity to practice the de-escalation skills that they're learning, and they receive feed feedback from the trainers. As a member of the advisory board, I've observed the training. I was impressed with the content, which includes people with mental health concerns who have been incarcerated, coming in, and sharing their experience this training has the potential to help officers better understand people with mental health concerns and to engage them, in de engage them to de-escalate crises. Deploying CIT has shown promising results. The first year of evaluation documented significant reduction in injury rates. 
and the mayor's management report for February 2017 showed that use of force in the units that had CIT decreased by 43%. Unfortunately, this is not measured in the most recent ma mayor's management report. To their credit, DOC and CHS work together to plan and deliver CIT trainings and are committed to its success, but it doesn't have the leadership um, from the top that it needs. Um, I have written testimony that um, describes what's necessary to make that a reality, and I hope that the City Council will embrace this method of violence reduction. But before I cede my time, I just have to take issue with what Council Member Holden said, his characterization of people with mental health concerns. He perpetuated stigma in this chamber, and I really appreciate that, the commis that Commissioner Brand spoke up and gave a very concrete example of how um, Things can be addressed with people who do have mental health concerns that do not involve hospitalization and institutionalization. And in fact, when I've been on the CIT advisory board, in our meetings, um, DOC staff have talked about how the post within the mental health units have actually become more desirable because there's actually less use of force there. And part of that has detracted from steady, steady staffing in those posts. But um, I think it's, it's unfortunate that he's not here to. No, I pre appreciate that. And we, um, in fact, as we noted, I think that some of the use of force stats in the, some of the mental health units are far better than uh, other units and certainly should at least look at those units in terms of what's working as a model for other units. Thank you for that. We'll also read your testimony with regard to the recommendations around the CITs. Thank you for that. Good afternoon. My name is Brandon Holmes, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the Close Rikers Campaign and as a member of the New York City Jails Action Coalition. Close Rikers Campaign and all of New York City counted a substantial victory in October when Council voted to shrink the system 75 percent, improve conditions for anyone still detained, and make parallel investments in community resources. But the jail population has been shrinking for years with minimal progress towards eradicating the culture of violence and abuse within the Department of Correction. As New York City celebrates being the least incarcerated big city in the nation, there has been little to no effort from the agency's leadership or the administration to confront the challenges of actualizing cost savings or holding individual officers who perpetuate violence accountable. The administration's strategy to achieve a reduction in DOC staff through attrition is both lazy and dangerous. For decades, we've, been, we've seen corrections officers leave their work and struggle with mental health concerns, suicide attempts, and extreme levels of stress. Many choose to leave because they cannot bear to continue working in such a toxic, violent environment or witness the daily violence inside city jails. We must believe that anyone who can tolerate this culture of violence and abuse has adapted to it and has accepted its history of opposition to reform. As the mayor and DOC leadership allow their staff to quit or collapse within this agency, there must be a better plan, a plan that identifies and incentivizes good behavior in order to truly transform our jail system. In early 2018, Close Rikers campaign leaders called for the complete elimination of the Department of Corrections before several officers were indicted on sexual assault charges, before the Nunes report confirmed a 98% increase in use of force, and before the agency was operating at a ratio of nearly two to one staff to people in custody. In December of that same year, we published this letter by survivors of Rikers Island, uh, which I have included with my testimony, naming that we identify that the safety of all staff and people who are detained behind those walls is important. But as this Department of Corrections opposes the elimination of solitary confinement, as this department fails to comply with key components of the federal monitor's consent judgment for the eighth year in a row, and as the department puts individuals like Khalif Browder, Laylene Polanco, and 18-year-old Nicholas Feliciano, who hung for seven minutes as correction staff neglected their duty, please ask yourselves, is this an agency that has a role in a decarcerated New York City? How will they possibly reflect our values of ending mass incarceration and improving conditions for incarcerated people? Just one follow-up question, because I, you didn't get an opportunity. I know you have some recommendations yeah. in here and questions, but one of them is the, um, you asked that the, uh, the, according to the testimony, the Federal Monitor requires DOC to report around disciplinary actions being taken. Can you, who, they report that to the Federal Monitor? 
they sh should be reporting that to the federal monitor and BOC, we've requested that the board request that report and make it public. And now today we're asking that the council also get that information because we have not seen it from the board yet. And, and the board has requested it? I, I cannot confirm. Okay. okay, we'll follow up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. My name is Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips, and I'm a member of the Jails Action Coalition, and I work at the Mental Health Project Urban Justice Center. I've sat on the advisory board for the DOC for the past six years, and I have been advocating around DOC inhumane culture and practices for the past nine years. The federal monitor's report continues to validate everything I say on the record. I've worked with Commissioner Pont and Shapiro, but no Commissioner Brand. Yes, she often comes before Board of Corrections and City Council and boasts of the very things us advocates have demanded and work with City Council to implement. The officers union today mentioned rape and sexual assaults, but let me be clear, last April the Bronx DA testified on the record that for the calendar year 2018, 60% of the alleged sexual assaults reported to her office were from the island against officers. The Manhattan DA said she received none. I've experienced myself violence behind the walls while doing cognitive behavioral therapy, yet ironically the situation was set up by officers, actual gang members who were resolving street beef. When we speak of safety, I've actually testified before you, Chair, to extend the DOC budget for additional officers against even against even other advocates because I work behind the wall. I've seen officers stuck for two and three tours and yet expected to be back on tour in less than eight hours. That is part of safety. This has not changed, although the staff has increased greatly. Their mental and physical well-being directly impacts the population. When DOC speaks of culture training, let's be clear, the DOC has yet to re has replaced half of their staff within the last four or five years, and yet while being aware that they are being monitored, change has not occurred. To me, that shows felt leadership. Now is the time for this council to hold DOC accountable across the board. Read the federal monitor's report. For example, two to three years ago, I sat before your chair and requested additional funds for the investigation department. Yet DOC sat on that funding and last December started that this squad that they spoke about today. The improper use of scans exposes individuals to unhealthy amounts of radiation. These are your constituents who will later suffer because of carelessness of DOC. And this council continues to not want to offend and refuses to hold them accountable. Uniform staff aren't reporting working scans, um, working the scans without being trained because their supervisors will place them in the worst pose. Another example of how bullies with badges are able to continue the culture of corruption and violence. DOC will immediately rearrest an incarcerated individual, yet allow their officers who should be fired to resign or wait until an individual has left the island to follow up on a report. Where's the accountability? Give me one more second, please. If Council Member Holden was here, I would tell him on the record, one out of five New Yorkers has a mental health concern. He referred to those with mental health concerns committing alleged acts of violence, and yet data shows that this very population is the majority of those who are often victimized. Individuals have no place, people with mental health concerns have no place in the correctional system, and this council needs to push the city forward with implementing mental health diversions throughout the city. In addition, there are little uses of force and pace and cap units due to the amount, the least amount of Department of Correction members running those units. And lastly, Books was mentioned in access to library and law, right? I, I finished, I just finished a book and DVD drive for a facility on the island because I saw a need that I could change immediately. And I begged the council to immediately follow up on this basic minimum standard, which is steadily ignored. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alexa Adams. I'm a member of Jails Action Coalition and I'm also a social work student. Um, currently interning with Urban Justice Center's Mental Health Project. Um, I'm new to New York and moved here just this past year to start school and jumped into my work. Um, I had limited knowledge coming in of how New York City jails operate and the culture of violence that is present upholding racism, classism, heterosexism, transphobia, and xenophobia. I started out doing research to familiarize myself with what is going on in these jails and I'm appalled with what I have seen and heard thus far. Uh, violence in New York City jails is killing people. Information from the New York Correctional Association and a report in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle reported that there have been 374 deaths in NYC jails since 2001. Uh, the majority of those relate to medical emergencies. DOC often ignores those having emergencies and results in this form of medical violence. 
Uh, take, for instance, Carlos Mercado, who passed away in 2013 as a result of a diabetic emergency. He was under DOC's care, yet did not receive care for 14 hours, despite clear warning signs that he was in need of help. The most recent examples of this medical violence is that of Leilin Polanco and Nicholas Feliciano. Um, DOC has shown that they are not capable to handle medical emergencies and it is resulting in preventable deaths which are oftentimes slow and agonizing. DOC has also shown time and time again that they are not equipped to handle those experiencing mental health emergencies and often rely on means resulting in physical, emotional, and psychological violence or relying on isolated confinement. Um, as you know, the independent monitor has found that the use of force for this period is the highest it has ever been. This is unacceptable and we must take action now to fix this. Um, lastly, due to this violence, there are over 374 families, parents, siblings, friends, and loved ones who no longer have these individuals in their lives. Um, I urge you to listen to the voices of survivors and their loved ones and to take what they have to say seriously. Um, those who have survived know how to start fixing this broken and violent system until we can imagine a world where jails and prisons are non-existent. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Herbert Murray, and I am the Close Brackets Island Leader for Just Leadership U USA. Uh, when I was 21 years old, I was arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to 15 years to life, and subsequently did 29 years. During my time in Rackers Island, I went to three block. And when they placed me in three block, they had contained two TVs, uh, three telephones, um, approximately six showers for approximately 120 individuals. That right there generated balance in and itself. Uh, when the individual officers were placed outside the gate, of the cell block, when those confrontations happened, she didn't run in there or he did not run in there to resolve the issues. They pressed the button and that informed the riot squad. And the riot squad is consist of various individuals throughout the jail. And it takes like approximately a half an hour for them to get information, get in their uniform, and riot <clears throat> and all the time, all hell is breaking loose in that cell block. And then when they finally come, they come in there busting heads. They don't come in there and trying to ascertain what happened. They come in here making an example by anybody that gets in their way. Somebody didn't say some officer, he getting knocked in the head with the stick. So this is the kind of culture that was generated during my time, which happened almost 40 years ago. The CEO was very abusive, especially to black and brown people. Every time you turn around, they're harassing us, they're jumping us, making us an example for everybody to see, and this is what they did. New York City must be whole, New York must hold all its laws enforcement agency accountable, including Department of Correction, in order to achieve diversion Diversion of the smaller, safer jail within the borough facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I have a hold it for you. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, do you think we could just switch with that? Oh, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Hi, good afternoon. Kelly Grace Price from Close uh, Rosies. I wanted to talk specifically about sexual violence um, in the city jails and the lack of the department's response to the issue. A lot of the things that I've said I have testified to before. I've been testifying about being finger popped on my way into the jail to, be visit, to visit people since 2015. We've been talking about these issues for a long time and they haven't been addressed. Um, I want specifically to call your attention first to point number in my testimony. Um, point number seven. Uh, because Councilman Powers, this is something that you and I have been speaking about since 2017 when you were still advocating to different Democratic clubs around town to get elected. And I remember specifically talking to you at Trinity Church up on East 89th Street about a PREA reporting bill and a sexual assault reporting bill, which as you know, you voted, was written into law in early 2019, but it is a POS. It doesn't even give us a basic number of complaints over the past year 
Alana knows very well that this is something I'm upset about. It needs to be addressed immediately and remedied. We still don't know the total number of complaints from 2018 <laughs> sexual assault complaints. That's anathema. There's no reason that the language should be so anemic to not even proffer that basic level of data. Um, there's some other things that I would like to discuss very quickly in my testimony that I haven't written down. Um, of course, I've been speaking about the Gerald Burrow rebuild plan that sticks all women in Queens, that will further isolate women and girls, make us more susceptible to sexual violence, and it's a blatant Title IX violation. I've sent my briefs about this to all the city council members. No one's done anything about it. Uh, Helen keeps saying, oh, we're going to open up a jail on Central Park North, but still one jail is not going to solve the Title IX issues and the sexual violence issues uh, of the current plan. Um, I want to talk about, quickly, the Board of Correction. Please look at the Glassdoor.com reviews by former Board of Correction employees. They're horrible. We cannot cure the violence problem without proper oversight. Um, you must pay attention to what's going on in the Board of Correction. The last thing that I will say is that I noticed that back in uh, 2017, two months before Mayor de Blasio announced his plan to close Rikers Island, that the chair of the city planning department, who also coterminously was the chair of the city planning commission, the famous Carl Weiss board, stepped down. Now, at the same time, a number of very large, large payments were made to a number of the same entities that are in charge now of the borough jail rebuild, rebuild plan, including HR, HRNA advisors, different PR firms that seem to have been invested in in order to direct the community outcry around closing Rikers Island. Uh, I'll send you my brief on this issue, but if the mayor already knew he was going to close Rikers back in 2014 when he appointed Weiss, Weiss Broad, and Weisbrod step, stepped down, and HRNA &H advisors, as you know, are the drafters of the one New York City plan, which was touted last Thursday in this hearing as the salve for what will happen with Rikers Island. If the mayor can align his planning all the way back in 2014 and fool the city into thinking that it was community groups that actually pushed for the closure when he was investing in it in the first place back in 2014 with Weisbrod, why can't he scheme and come up with a plan to cure the violence in the jails? It looks to me like the entire Close Rikers movement is a parody. It was all directed by the mayor's office. It was all paid for in 2014, 2015, far before any of these groups came forward. We must hold our mayor's feet to the fire. We cannot allow him to pull the wool over our, our eyes if he is able to orchestrate this kind of uh, behemoth community planning behind our backs, he can certainly figure out a way to cure violence in the okay. city jails. Thank you, and I, I won't speak on behalf of the mayor, but I know I can tell you that from my standpoint, having coming coming in before I came to the body and then after, it was certainly not educated by folks who have been organizing in this space, who are many impact, who are impacted by the system as well, who I think came to my, me and others before to advocate for the closure of Rikers based on their own personal experiences, but I won't speak on behalf of the, the mayor or his office, I'll let them speak themselves. Um, thank you for everybody. I'm sorry for a very long day in hearing. Thank you for everybody's patience, and we will be uh, taking all your suggestions as follow items. Thank you.